Whew, man, I am winded. Uh, Shannon and I just got finished having to break these two up. It was flying <laughs> fireworks backstage. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. For, I'm not gonna lie. It was love. It's love. Yeah. I'm fighting his IP address right now. Damn it. John landed a uh, uh, John landed a hell of a, a a right hook before we even went on to the uh, the show. So he did. Yeah, good. he did. The debate like, loves you, did he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and debate's already over. It's done. <laughs> Steve's been knocked out. It, 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 it's kind of like uh, I imagine um, John and Steve in their underwear, nose to nose, like those spiders do at UFC. Why would you do that? No, I don't want to hear the rest of that. Because <laughs> I have to, I have to look at things from every angle, Steve. That's my job. Okay, <laughs> not helping. Uh, but uh, welcome everybody. We're going to have a hell of a show tonight. I think. It's just a I'm seeing Twitter. Uh, Twitter, I put up a poll. I'm going to talk about it in just a second. But I put up a poll to see what people's thoughts were heading into this debate. And then um, afterwards, you guys can go there and vote on a second poll. And we'll kind of compare the results to see if anybody's viewpoints were swayed in either direction. But uh, let's first say hello to everybody. And then we will dive into that. So my lovely co-host this evening, um, and I can for the first time on this show, say lovely co-host is Shannon. Welcome, Shannon. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I very much appreciate I'm being here. I'm excited. Um, I see your, no, your backdrop. Um, I, thought I, I thought we asked for a, uh, an unbiased moderator. No, I'm not biased. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and, and we will uh, also say hello to John Perry. I'll, I'll, of course, introduce you guys officially when we get to the, the topic, but just as casual, mm -hmm. stating casually hello. Um, hello, John. Welcome back. Hello. Hello. It's good to be here. So, so, um, so Steve, I think you should tell people yes, about uh, you being in Twitter jail if they don't know. Sure. Um, and first, I just want to say that, um, you know, he stated clearly, but I'm stated correctly. So uh, oh. let's get that out of the way. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I'm in Twitter jail for another six days because uh, I guess, I, and I can't, I can't say there was uh, Mr. Andrew that uh, reported me, but somebody reported three of my tweets that I had to delete and it gave me a seven day timeout. One of which that uh, because I'd asked uh, without a crystal ball to write about this particular topic, I guess I was quote unquote silent and voice is the terminology they used. So I'm in Twitter jail for another six more days. Yeah. So you know what that means? That means all those people that said that you were trying to censor them in the live chat and all that, they're correct. You are trying to silence voices. Clearly. Yeah, except that my voice got silenced because of reasons. It's okay. Right, I mean, ironic. you know what's nice, though? I've been really mellow since I have any dumpster fires on Twitter, right? It's a calming <laughs> Yeah, effect. me too. It's weird. It's almost like my I know Twitter people are bored now. Dumpster fire anymore. <laughs> I wonder why. Oh. Like, what happened to Twitter? It's no fun. Where's Steve? Let me talk to Dave for a second. Uh, Dave, sure. The um the the picture that I sent earlier for our North of the show that up really quick. Oh. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, this is a second. Let me um, get that up. Because uh, today is a special day in Canada, and so I thought it would be. Nice to oh, yeah. wish, you know, wish you all a lovely Thanksgiving. It's odd to think that we're so close, but yet you guys are celebrating a holiday a month early. I mean, this is not supposed to happen, eh? <laughs> you guys celebrated a month late, is I think what you mean to say, but all right. Is it just like uh, down here, Shannon? Like, you do the, the, the big dinners and, and lunch, and then everybody go and run over everybody and shopping it's over <laughs> there's not as much running over each other to go shopping because everything's closed today uh, uh but we all have a big dinner and watch football the cfl has a bunch of big games going on today so Ooh, you know we have a football right. league right <laughs> we have our own no. we need turkey uh, and ham you, and you can take it um I, I imagine canadian football to be like a bunch of time they bump into each other going oh sorry Oops, sorry. Oops, yeah. sorry. We only play touch football, actually. It's like, it's like flag oh. football. Like, we, we won't hit Excellent. each other. And even still, we say sorry. That's okay, so uh, 
uh, I just have a couple of uh, announcements, and then we will jump into the topic tonight. Uh, tomorrow, or Wednesday, we have uh, Emma Morass, who is the famous next door, coming back onto the show. She will be in a, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I can call it a debate, because it will be intended as a debate, but I think it will quickly turn into a hellacious dumpster. Terrence Pop is a, <laughs> um, a, a mid owl. He is a man that is going his own way. And so uh, the feminists will meet the, <laughs> the as far to the other end of the spectrum as you can, and we'll see what happens. Um, Thursday, we will be doing the Bacon Roulette. If you guys are interested in being a part or coming on and making a topic, what we do is we put a bunch of random and we spend, and you will vote based on how you uh, on the topic, whether you agree with the topic or you disagree with the topic, and then two people are chosen at random. You come in and you have uh, a 10 minute discussion, so it's kind of like a long hand. So, if you're interested in doing that, join us in the Discord. I'm still waiting on my debate roulette dumpster fire, that has not happened yet. We've done nine of them, <laughs> and all of them have been fantastic. So, uh, actually, honestly, and Steve can back me up on this. Some of them have been better than the actual planned debates that we've hosted on here. So Very that's cool. It's, it's odd. It's surprising. Yeah, it's yeah. Odd. But no preparation that people come in and have a discussion like that. It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I give props. Oh. Saturday, we have a flat earth debate. He's been saying that he wanted to get in the ring with a flat earther, so he will get his feet wet, so to speak, on that. Uh, because water always finds its level. So. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, God damn it. And then finally, next Tuesday, uh, we will be having a discussion on the death penalty, whether it should be abolished, and that will be with David Pakman. Uh, he will be here on Tuesday. So be sure that you tune. Um, I, as I alluded to earlier, I did a poll on Twitter, just kind of gauging everybody's thoughts and, and where they stand on this. Uh, I'm talking about tonight. And, you, know, you, got some, you got something going on with your... Uh... Your connection. You're choppy as you're, can be. You're choppy as hell. You're breaking up every other word. What about now? <laughs> no? You still were. One second. Bear with me. Okay. Better now. I think so. We can try. Go. Good. Good. Okay. So on Twitter. The results for the <laughs> poll that were put up. Nope. Nope. Still bad. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, Steve, People are uh, while he's doing uh, that, while he's fixing that, you can look at my cup. People are amazed by my cup. I don't know why I do. I have the same cup all the time. I drink coffee from. This is my coffee. Actually, I have more than one of these. I have like three. Um, it's just like it's magic. Green, I assume, or blue. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's green. <laughs> magic. This is I made I make a cup of co a pot of coffee has four cups in it right first one was four the second cup well, the one I did was three so this is actually seven cups of coffee I've had prepared for this so I may not get anybody to believe me well, my DNA is not a code but I'm sure they're all going to be wired enough to try yeah <laughs> oh good wired up miss? Steve just what everybody needs <laughs> Steve's getting exactly. wired up and we're all really excited about it you should Excellent. see me when I'm excited. Okay. Hopefully it's uh, oh, it's better now. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Much. All right. Uh, so on the, yeah. on the uh, Twitter poll, I asked the question, would you consider DNA a code? And this is how the results now before the, this uh, debate happens said, okay? Yes, for 23%. No, 51%. Undecided, 20%. So that means... John, you have uh, an uphill mountain to climb during this. Uh, well, I would like I, to point out that I was one of those people who vo who voted no because the question was worded wrong. <laughs> and I'd like to point out that I didn't DNA vote because I'm a traitor to hell. I can't vote. DNA Thank itself you very is not much. code. DNA itself is not code. The genetic code is a code. DNA is a molecule that that code is sometimes written in. It can also be written in RNA uh, and so on. You should have totally called me out for Spoilers. that. I, would, I could have. I, would have, uh, <laughs> I think it was worded just fine because that's what people ask about. But it, it, there's 20% that's undecided. Yeah, that's the ones that, uh, you know. 
Yeah, I'm already, I've already won Stop by that title, contest. by the way, because we both agree that's not a goad <laughs> in that regard. So in that regard, I'm done. Can I go home now? Thanks very much. See you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so the debate that I originally <laughs> hoped we would was, is the genetic code a code? And I think that Steve still does disagree yeah, with me on I, that. I planned right. ahead. Okay. Yeah, I planned it. I planned okay. it. I know. I, we're we're okay. good. <laughs> yeah, I made this interesting. I know that you, you and I both agree that the molecule itself is not a code, code and I will point that out. Okay, so after, okay. This, after this debate, I will fix that in, um, in the, the follow-up poll will actually be worded correctly. I think, I need to fix that in I think it's worded just two. fine. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Give me any uh, advantage here. Uh, I'm the underdog here, even though most people are going to be agreeing with me, I think. I'm still the underdog, and all three of you want to see me lose. <laughs> I refuse to agree with you, even if you're right. <sighs> okay, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, but somebody uh, pointed out uh, I'm already home. Good point. Thank you. During, uh, during this uh, debate, Shannon's going to be moderating. She will be the unbiased. Um, Voice of reason. Totally not somebody that would hashtag a team that they favor moderator so ignore <laughs> i'm kidding um but uh let's say hello to uh the first debater is a he hosts some show that all they do is talk to weird people and it's it's not worth watching trust me but um he also has his own channel That's true he has his own channel where he talks about uh science in depth has deep conversations with uh, very smart people and um, sometimes they're, they're not so smart. You never know what you're going to get, but it's an excellent channel. And he is also the host of the Great Debate Community, a community of several. What are you up to now, Steve? How many people? Uh, in the Great Debate Community? Yeah. Uh, eight, almost 1,800. But unfortunately, as you guys may have found out today, Google is shutting down G+. I didn't know that. We did not know. Yes. Uh, oh no! Uh, end of next year, I believe it is. Or, well, we don't know the extent of what's going to happen, but as of right now, that the, the normal accounts are going to be terminated uh, at some point within the next year. So G Plus is going away. They don't know if the communities are or the Hangouts, but we'll find out and we'll let people know. Go to Discord. Just move over to MySpace. You're good. Oh yes, <laughs> everyone loves MySpace. <laughs> No. Especially Tom. Tom loves my I, st I still have Tom as a friend. Tom is Tom is the best friend I've ever had. He's like the longest friend I've ever had. He never talks back. He never gets angry. Tom's great. Tom's, Tom's great. Everybody loves Tom. A funny thing, a funny thing, real quick as a side note, I had a viewer for Twitter, you know, in the request thing, people that maybe you don't follow. You have a tab where you go for people who it doesn't show up in your your regular DMs, but there's a tab that says like requests for people who are trying to send you a message. Well, I clicked that and somebody said, found this, thought you might like it. And it was a, uh, it was a link to my MySpace when I was in college. And oh, I, was, I, <laughs> I was like, why is it MySpace like burnt to the ground now? Kill it with fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nuke yeah, it awesome. space. The <laughs> next, uh, the next gentleman with us uh, runs a fantastic Science channel and a channel that is uh, more casual. It's the perfectly named, uh, stated casually. But, uh, he also has stated clearly, which dives into science related uh, topics and explains them in a way that is easy to understand and follow. And um, I have been a huge fan for a long time, even long before he came on um, to do a presentation with, also with Shannon, on um, replacing. Uh, or had to do with replacing Darwin, or we went into uh, some of the things that that book had. Um, it's a pleasure to have him here. He's also, uh, he worked for the Center of the uh, Chemical Evolution, a NASA-funded research group focused on understanding the origin of life. The study, among other things, issues, studies, among other things, surrounds the origin of the genetic code, which we'll be talking about um, tonight. But a fantastic guy. Excellent uh, science communicator, and it's a pleasure to have him, John Perry. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Wow, Thank he you. gets all that, and I get, hey, it's Steve. You're like my, <laughs> you're like my, my <laughs> hey, I've been a big uh, fan. I've been a fan uh, of John's too, so I, I, I've watched his videos, and I'm a huge fan as well. So you're like my husband, though. You know what I'm saying? And like, we go places, it's like, you're Steve, and you're like everybody's husband. husband. Like, everybody wants to marry you. Every woman, every guy, every, everybody, it's like, Kyle's my husband. It's like not polyamory to the nth degree. The, the person that called me a gnome, a, di a discount garden gnome, yeah, fuck not him. to marry me. <laughs> yeah. So, that was okay, me. Shannon. Discount garden gnome. 
Shannon, I'm, I'm handing the, floor, the reins to you, uh, and we will kick it off. All right. I expect a fair fight. Nobody talk over <laughs> each other. Okay, we both know that both of you have presentations this evening, and we agreed beforehand that Steve was going to go first. So we are going to start the presentation portion. So everybody will have a moment or, or the time that they require to go through their presentation, and then we're going to have some just free-form discussion. Does that sound agreeable to both of you? Sounds good. All right. Okay, all right. Dave, do you mind transitioning the screen and putting on Steve's presentation, please and thank you? All right, Steve, the floor is yours. Don't right, make um, me just, mad. I'll try, I'll try not to. Just so people know, um, my slide has got corrupted. I, I had some errors in this particular presentation. I will correct them as we go. Um, but unfortunately, this was a PDF file that I had saved. And it's the only copy I have left. So I have to use this particular copy. So there are some mistakes, but I'll go through them. And so um, getting into this discussion, I wanted to have some object, uh, objectives at first and, and to clarify that both John and I have talked about this for a long time over the last couple of weeks. And we both agree that the question DNA is a code is formed because the DNA molecule, we both agree, is not a code, I, I think. But there are people out there mm -hmm. that think it is. So I think it's it's a valid question to them, them but to John and I, like, no, it's not a code. Oh, so anyways, our objectives. Um, explain the very basics of the central dogma of biology, which is the DNA to mRNA to proteins, which John is going to do as well. Um, I think we're going to have exactly the same presentation as far as that. Um, I want to show that DNA itself is not a code, especially a true code, but a macromolecule that shows, stores biological information, and that there's a difference between a code and a cipher. And I'll skip the next slide because that was an error, and then go right to the next one. There we go. Thank you. Um, my arguments will be basically that DNA itself is not a code. It's a macromolecule, which, again, I can't change that, but we agreed that it's not. So that one's kind of... Uh, no longer applicable. But the genetic code is a misnomer, and that is an analogy for heuristic approach to understanding concepts. Um, it is more a, a, aptly akin to a cipher than a code. And I'll be explaining the differences between a code and a cipher and why it, it tends to be more of a cipher than a code, uh, but it's kind of pseudo of both, depending on how you use the terminology, whether you're coming from cryptography or you're coming from information theory or um, whatever, from biology, these the words mean different things to different people. And I've, I've talked to many different people and special you know, specialists and experts in one field say it is, other ones say it's not. So I think it depends on what your area of expertise is. Next. Um, what is DNA? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a macromolecule. Uh, most people have had, you know, some biology, so this is kind of review for them. It has four nucleotides that it's comprised of with a sugar phosphate backbone. Uh, it's read by what's called RNA polymerase, what a little enzyme comes on and it, it basically will, will attach to the, and as it does, it produces an mRNA stand, strand, which is messenger RNA. Next strand, uh, next slide. This is called the process of transcription. The central dogma of biology is basically DNA through transcription will go to mRNA, mRNA will go to a ribosome, and then it'll be translated into a protein. Um, the way this works, again, is this RNA polymerase will read the DNA, and as it does, it produces an mRNA strand. That mRNA strand then goes through a uh, uh, little thing in the uh, cell uh, nucleus that'll go to the ribosome. The ribosome will, will have a process by which it translates it, and it forms what's called a polypeptide chain. Uh, this chain will also be called a protein of some over a certain amount of amino acids. Next slides. Okay. Uh, the relationship to RNA and DNA, besides a, a different sugar base, is that the RNA is a complement to the DNA strand, which strand with some exceptions. The T will be coded for A, the A will be coded for U, which is uracil instead of uh, thiamine. C will code to G, G will code to C. Um, again, I'm doing this real quickly, and this is very basic. Um, if people want to get more technical about this, we can do that later on. But I, this is just kind of more of a review for the people that have had biology. Um, the three RNA base pairs translates into a specific amino acid. This is called a nucleotide triplet. So each of those three things, like AUG, will code for a specific thing. Um, and that will look at a chart and see what they will code for. And I'm using that code in this particular case as an analogy because this is how we, we communicate a concept. Next slide. The mRNA to protein process in the ribosome 
works by this. You have what's called a tRNA or transfer RNA that has an anticodon and an amino acid attached to it. The specific three letters will code for a very specific amino acid. And as that chain that you see at the very top grows, it's a growing peptide chain, each amino acid will be added one by one. Um, the proteins th th will be comp comprised of either one peptide chain or multiple peptide chains. And a peptide chain is really just a group of amino acids that's been put together through peptide bonds. Next. Um, the way that the tRNA codes for this, no, excuse me, what, um, and I was going to change this, so this is one of the mistakes I made. It's not really tRNA is encoded for, is that tRNA is produced through a non coding process because it's part of non coding. RNA. So the way this basically works, people have asked me before, why, why do we have a very specific tRNA with a very specific code on, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, nuclear amino acid on it? And the reason being is because you have this enzyme kind of amino, called aminoactyl tRNA synthase. This particular one is specific for methionine. What happens is you have a tRNA for methionine uh, that will fit exactly in that enzyme. You have the methionine amino acid that goes on the top, and then ATP, which is the energy molecule used to fuse them together, and that produces AMP, which is a, 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 a adenosine monophosphate plus two uh, phosphate atoms. So it breaks apart a bond that releases energy, and it charges that tRNA. So now it's tRNA met, and that that's what it'll take out of the the cell nucleus to. to put in the ribosome to cause that chain because all these things are floating around. So I'll pull that one out and that's what I'll bond to it based upon the codon. Next. So this is not this is not an RNA synthesis chart. This was a mistake that I made. I don't know why I called it the RNA synthesis chart. It's not. It's just a codon ch chart. So the way this works is pretty simple. There are three letters in the triplet. If the first letter is U, you go to the, you go to the, the first thing. If it's um, A is the next one or the second letter, which are the column, and then you look at the row for the third letter. And if you notice on here, certain things will only code for one particular amino acid. If you look at UGG, that'll only code for tryptophan. However, things like proline will be, will be many different things will code for it. CC, anything. CCC, CCA, CCG, CCU, those are all code for proline. That's called third base wobble. And that's gonna be critical to why this is not a code. And yes, I know that I'm going through this very quickly because I want to get to the code portion because I think that's what the main just I, I think so far everything John's going to agree with me on. Did I, John? Real quick, is there anything that I that you want to touch on real quick that just on the uh, the biology stuff? Uh, no. I agree so far. No. Okay. I mean, th this chart here, this set of rules is what people typically call the genetic code. Right. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, what is a code? A code is usually a cryptic substitution system that's decided on two or more people called the sender and receiver. Codes are secondary symbols that represent a primary symbol. For example, the car is fast. Car could stand for, quote, nuclear weapon, and fast, quote, for ready for launch. This way, if a third party intercepted that coded message, they would need what's called a code book to understand what the secondary symbols represent. So in this particular case, a true code is a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you have a word, you have something else that it represents, you have a separate symbol. So that symbol of nuclear weapon, right? think of it as one object, represents the one object car. So if people were, excuse me, the other way around, the, the car would represent the nuclear weapon. So we had an enemy, right, that intercepted this message and they got the, the message car is uh, fast, they wouldn't know what it means unless they had the code book to translate that it was car represents nuclear weapon and fast means ready to launch. That's what is a true code. So the symbol is what is the code. And, uh, next slide. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> am, I one code, am I one slide ahead? Because I forgot to tell you to, there you go. Um, the genetic code, um, if we assign primary symbols to the nucleotides in the DNA by labeling them, right? If I, if I tell somebody ahead of time, if I want adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine to rep be represented by a secondary system, a, a secondary code, then I will say A, T, C, and G is the code. That is the code that represents those specific nucleotides. Those are arbitrary. I could be any, use anything, right? I pick anything I want, but it, it just so happens that I think the first letters very basic way to code 
for those particular nucleotides. So that, that seems trivial to me. I don't think that's what really is implied when somebody says DNA is a code. Because I do agree that A, T, C, and G, those symbols are a code because they're secondary symbols representing the primary symbols, the secondary being A, T, C, and G, the primary being adenine, thiamine, cytosine, and guanine, and the, and the words themselves, not just the, the ontological, meaning the in existence, nucleotides in the DNA. Next. Um, the word code is polysemous, meaning it has multiple different meanings. And that's one of the, the problems when people say, is DNA code? It really means, what do you mean by code? If it, what uh, Are you looking at it from, a, are they, obviously, is it a program language? Well, no, DNA is not a program language. But they use the word code and, pro, code and programming language. And the reason why is because in a programming language, you have some instruction that is the secondary symbol that executes something by representing a primary symbol or string. For example, J and Z in assembly language means jump short if not zero. There's, you have different flags in a computer, as people may know. One of them is called the, the zero flag. If that happens to be zero, then you'll jump to some other memory location or some other part of the code. And J and Z is, is a code because it's, it's coded by somebody that's performed a specific action to jump if not zero if a condition is met. That is, that is a programming language or code. Next. So what is a cipher, though? Well, a cipher works on a little bit different principle. Cipher works generally, uh, you, you encrypt or decrypt by use of an algorithm. Not always, not necessarily. It, again, it depends on what you mean by cipher. But unlike the need for a code book where you have a word or phrase representing another word, ciphers work on a more bit-by-bit -bit system. It works on one letter at a time. And it can be usually deciphered if you know the algorithm. For example, if I wanted to decipher a phrase, the nuclear weapon is ready to launch, I could use a Caesar shift by shifting each letter one to the right on the alphabet, resulting in, well, what you see there, because I'm not going to be able to pronounce it. But that would be a cipher, because all I have to do to know how to decipher that is know how it was originally ciphered and used as deciphering algorithm, which would case, in this case be shift it one to the left. Next slide. So in order to cipher that string, I, I just have to know the deciphering algorithm, which is called the key of the cipher of the Caesar shift. In this case, be one letter to the left to get back to the original encrypted message. I could do that with any kind of encryption. As long as I have the key, I could decipher the original message. And a fun fact is there's something called a vermin cipher, which is unbreakable so long as you know the rules of the cipher are followed. They're called a one-time pad based upon Shannon's communication theory of secrecy systems, which I think John's going to get into a little bit, which is one of the reasons I mentioned it here. Next. So why isn't DNA code? Well, obviously we've already established DNA as a macromolecule. So when they say DNA is a code, that as itself is clearly a not true statement. DNA itself as the molecule is not a, a code. But I think John and I both realize that that's not really the question at hand. Because um, uh, he agrees, saying DNA mind, is a code is a, sure. yeah. Do you mind if I explain uh, why, is, why DNA itself is not a code, just real quick? Absolutely, um, go for it. The, so the pages in a book can carry a message with ink on that page, but the page itself uh, just just ink and paper is not a message and DNA can carry messages but DNA itself is not a message so there's vast amounts of DNA in our genome that's not used to carry any sort of encoded message so that's why DNA itself is not a code it's just the material that the code that the messages are written in same thing like your hard drive is not a code the information on it is different from the hard drive right so it, like you said it's saying a book mm -hmm. is a code rather than the information compiled in it right so we both agree that that is not the code um i yes. do believe that the genetic code of atgc is a code where you're representing uh, letters which is your secondary symbology represents a specific type of nucleotide so a t c and g those those letters are genetic code um, and I think that's when they when they talk about the genetic code, that's what they're specifically referring to as an information. But the information um, itself is more of a cipher than a code. Next slide, and I'll explain why. So why DNA, isn't DNA not a code? Um, one could use a codon chart to determine what amino acid each nucleotide triplet is going to code for, right? But unfortunately, for a code, it is a one-to-one -one correspondence. One word means one phrase or one phrase means one word. Um, unfortunately, because of biology, 
certain um, other uh, things like prokaryotes won't exactly code for an amino acid for the same triplet. Like, for example, in, in eukaryotes, AAA will code for lysine, right? But in other things, it may not be lysine. And GAU, for aspartate, I think in prokaryotes, um, it, it, I don't remember what it coded for, but they, they don't code for the exact same thing. So you can't say that the, the, the three letters are a one-to-one -one correspondence because it depends on what code on chart you're using for different species. Prokaryote will have a little bit different, especially for the start and stop codon. For methylene, it's the start codon, which it tells where to start the transcription. That is different from species as well. Next slide. Um, why, why isn't a triplet a code? Because some people say that the three letters is a code. Well, no, that's more of a cipher because, again, it's, it's representing individual um, letters to represent one particular amino acid. Um, the RNA codon chart is degenerate. And again, I don't know why I called it the, called it the RNA codon chart. Scratch that. It's this the codon chart. Um, is degenerate, meaning that more than one triplet can encode for amino acid. Because again, third base wobble. There's a redundancy in it. And, and with a code, you can't have redundancy. You have to have a one-to-one -one correspondence to have a code. Because if you have a code book, then you, you need to know what word is representing or what phrase is representing something else. And if you have multiple possibilities, then you're not communicating to the person you're trying to communicate the code to what your message is. So it has to be one-to-one. -one. So in that regards, because it's not universal, it cannot be a code. Uh, here we go. So yeah, so I knew I found it somewhere. Uh, it's AA and humans codes for lysine, but in, 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 uh, in, uh, in other species like starfish, it'll code for aspergine. So that is not a one quantum correspondence in a kind of terms. Next, almost done. Um, I want to touch a little bit on Shannon information only for the fact that I think this is going to be where John's coming from. He's going to be coming from communication theory. And Shannon was the one that kind of came came along and said, okay, what does it mean to have entropy, uh, excuse me, information in a system based upon the entropy of the system? So the way it works is this, in a very succinct nutshell. Log base 2n is the minimum of number of bits to carry the information of DNA. When there's four possible nucleotides, it would take log base 2 of 4, which, if you do the math, is equal to 2 bits of information. That'll cover all possible states, okay? If you have 0, 0, each one of those is 1 bit each, so you have 2 bits. That'll represent like T, 0, 1, A, 1, 0, C, and 1, 1, G. So for the four possible states, you only need 2 bits of information because those 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 can represent all four of those. Okay, so that's what standard information kind of basically is. Next. A little more simpler, a quarter can have two possible states, heads or tails, assuming fair coin and outcome, meaning that is the, the coin is weighted properly and it won't land on the edge, and you have to have an outcome of one or the other, probability of one. In this particular case, the minimum bits to describe the possibilities is log base 2, 2, which is one bit. Zero for heads, one for tails. It only requires one bit to do that. Next. Uh, Shannon information and entropy. Um, I was going to remove this because I thought it was kind of um, too much for this particular uh, discussion, but I'm going to, I, I, since then here, um, the minimum amount of information and bits to effectively communicate a, a signal or meshes via a noisy channel due to entropy. What that basically meant is that if I have a channel where you're not getting 100% efficiency, what is the minimum amount of bits that I need to communicate a signal from the sender to the receiver? And that's based upon a very well-known formula for entropy, WK log M in this particular case is just a modification of log omega, where omega is the microstates of the system. But uh, if you if you ever look into thermodynamics, that formula is ubiquitous. It's a very very common uh, formula in entropy. Next, for entropy. But what Shannon did is he, he he took the entropy and he made it a formalization for it, which is the that formula there. I'm not going to get into the specifics of this. The only reason I brought it up is that the when you apply it to DNA. It's based upon the in, the index there of I as an element of A, C, G, and T, meaning that Shannon information is contingent upon those symbols. Again, information and code are not exactly the same thing. Um, the information in the system is not the code. The code is C, C, and G, or A, C, T, A, C, G, T. Next. Things, things that the uh, DNA doesn't code for. Um, not all DNA codes for protein. Right, so when you're talking about DNA, there are other things that it it will make. It'll make tRNA or what's called non 
coding RNA, uh, which is transcribed but is not ever translated into proteins. Um, the exons, if you look at uh, RNA, it'll have introns and exons, and the, the pre-RNA uh, gets, gets spliced when it takes all those introns out and is just left with the exons. Um, yeah, I should. I had that backwards, by the way. That was another mistake that I made that I wanted to correct. Um, it, it keeps the ex exons, it, it splices out the introns. Um, also, it doesn't code for protein folding, which is a very critical part of how proteins work. They have to be shaped exactly right to work. Uh, that the, the DNA sequence has no bearing on how that protein is going to be folding. Um, it's based on, on conformational changes due to charges from the amino acid residues, it's called. Um, it has no effect on gene expression. So th these things that are incorporated into the system have nothing to do with the code, but they all go into um, how proteins are made. Next. Um, also, the code doesn't code for epigenetic factors, um, histone acetylation, deacetylation modification, which is basically a fancy way of saying how much DNA is going to be exposed to that RNA polymerase. Those little protein things, those little round things, DNA goes around those. And if it's really tightly wrapped, the RNA polymerase can't get to it, right? It has to be kind of loosely wrapped. And if it's re they're really close together, the polymerase can't get in between them. So what histone uh, modification does is kind of separate those histones, allowing the RNA polymerase to reach the DNA easier. That's not coded, that's not quote unquote coded by those sequences in the DNA. Next. Additional thoughts on DNA not being a code. Um, co this is, and I think this is a real big one. Um, codes require portability from one medium to another. Uh, DNA contains information, but nothing that can be detached and transferred to some other medium, like raised bumps, such as braille or magnetic tape. So if I said, I want to take the code off RNA, uh, DNA, it's not portable. It doesn't translate into braille, because the braille, all that can represent as the A, D, C, and G, which is the code. This is the same problem you have with Morse code. Morse code is not a code. Morse code is a cipher. This is the same thing with binary. Binary is not a true co code in that regard. Um, matter of fact, uh, if you actually go look at Morse code, they actually call it Morse cipher in a lot of places because it is more technically a cipher than a code. Um, what is transferred to RNA and proteins by means of the central dogma biology is merely chemical and physical structure by which the laws of chemistry by psychophysical or psych psychochemical conformational changes. So what that basically implies is that the only thing that's really being ported over from the DNA to the protein is how to put those amino acids together, right, to form the protein. There's no code in that actual system. There's no code in there, information. Next. Okay, can I just ask I a quick question here? This is my last one, by the way. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, if binary code is not a code and uh, Morse code is not a code, then what are some examples of code, according to you? Uh, I, the, the, having a code book, for example. Like for oh, example, you can have a code book, can have a code book for binary code. Yeah, but, I mean, there's code. We'll, we'll get in. Let me, finish, let me finish up. Okay, yeah. okay. But, okay. I, 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 but yeah, <laughs> Morse, Morse code Steve, is technically you more correct than cipher. John, you're going to get your turn. I thought I was going to have to yell at Steve, but John. <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> at the end, you guys will get a chance to go back and forth. Let Steve finish his presentation. Steve? Yeah. Okay, finish so I think, I think what it boils John, down to. John, behave yourself. I think the word code is used differently in different things. I've looked at information theory. I've looked at signal processing. Um, uh, I've, I have worked a little bit with discrete signal processing, and the, the term code is not utilized that way in that. Computer programming is used completely different. It's used as a program language. Language is not a code. Um, I know a lot of people argue language is code, but everything I've looked at so linguistically, it's, it's not a code. Uh, again, this, the symbology would be that you have a secondary set of symbols representing a primary symbol. Um, language is not a one-on-one -on -one correspondence. It cannot be a code. But if you, but again, biology, law, like even in the, the terminology of, of a legal system, a code is by which, by, by actions, we were supposed to uh, abide by, right? You have a legal code. That's not what, a, a code by which I think John would agree that we're talking about. So even in biology, legal, cryptography, the word code has multiple different meanings. I'm arguing from the most strictest, which is called sensu strictissimo, position that DNA is not a code. Sensu lato, which is a very broad definition, people can call it a code, but I still think it's much more of an analogy than a true code. And 
Um, I just want to uh, end with Dave. I sent you a, a something that I can't screen share. Can you can you do it real quick? And while he's waiting on that, let me make an announcement real real quick uh, to you guys. Uh, if you watched the show last night where we had the guy that came on to talk about the, the 1080 poison that's going on in New, um, New Zealand. Uh, if you remember, in the middle of the interview, or when we were kind of wrapping up, his wife broke into the interview and said that the police were at the door and they had come to take his guns and his uh, gun license. So we had to cut it abruptly short. Well, he actually continued to film and sent me the video of his confrontation with the police. So we'll be uploading that to the channel tomorrow and you'll be able to see um, the police come in um, searching for the, the guns and how that unfolded. So be sure to check that out tomorrow morning uh, on the Crazy. channel. Yeah, it's wild. Okay, go ahead. And I just put the link in for some other things like where it says Morse code is not a uh, code. It says, despite its name, Morse code is not a code, but a cipher. But I did want to leave uh, with, with Francis Crick, who did one of the discoverers of the, of the triple helix of DNA. He said this, he said, um, and this is from Who Wrote the Book of Life, a story of genetic code. In, year, in fact, years later, Crick granted, quote, the proper technical term for such a translation rule, strictly speaking, not a code, but a cipher. In the same way that Morse code should be really called Morse cipher. I did not know this at the time, which was fortunate because, quote, genetic code sounds a lot more intriguing than, quote, genetic cipher. That is from the, that is from the one that actually won a Nobel Prize for determining the structure of DNA. So even he grants it is much more like a cipher than a code. Um, and if people want to go look up Morse code is more like a cipher, they're more than welcome to. I put the link in the video in the live chat. And uh, there you go. Pleasures. All right. A bit longer than I expected. <laughs> Thank I'm sorry. you, Steve. And I was talking fast. You it's were. a lot of all stuff right, to go Steve. over. It's John's turn now. So, all right. So, we have a little hashtag war going on on Twitter. Don't forget to at non sex show. So, we have hashtag team Steve and hashtag team John. So, now <laughs> it is going to be John's turn. I'm just saying. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> hashtag team John. All right. So, Dave, do you mind putting up John's presentation? Uh, thank you. So I've got a lot All of right. spots in here for questions. And uh, I'm happy to have Steve ask questions during that time or people who are writing in to uh, ask questions during that time. So if we get super chats or whatever, I've got lots of spots in this for that. But so again, the question that I, I was really hoping we were going to ask here is, is the genetic code a real code? Because uh, you know, as Steve and I both agree, DNA itself is not. It's just the molecule that the code is written in. This, uh, this little box here on the screen, this code on chart, this is the set of rules that govern the genetic code. And uh, if we can go to the next slide here, we'll get a, we'll get a quote from good old Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called uh, the, A River Out of Eden. And in this, he says, after Watson and Crick, we know that genes themselves within their minute internal structure are long strings of pure digital information. What is more, they are truly digital in the full and strong sense of computers and compact disks, not in the weak sense of the nervous system. The genetic code is not a binary code, as in computers, nor an eight level code, as in some telephone systems, but a quaternary code with four symbols. The machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. So according to code, uh, people who study computers, things like binary code, the genetic code is a real code. And if we go to the next slide, This here is the reason that there are so many people today, I think, that are upset calling the genetic code a real code. And it's because there is this argument that comes from creationists. It says that the genetic code is a real code. All codes that we know of were intelligently designed. Uh, binary code was, for example. Morse code was, for example. Therefore, they conclude the genetic code was intelligently designed. Next slide. So, you know, this is, that's a syllogism, and the syllogism is, 
I mean, the the conclusion does follow the the two premises. So they've they've correctly written a syllogism, but one of their premises is wrong, and that's why their conclusion is also wrong. And a lot of atheists I've noticed online lately have been assuming that premises one is wrong. The syllogism is, I mean. Oh, did he freeze? Did or, I'm, I'm just waiting. I, I keep, I'm taking notes here, and all of a sudden, I just got quiet. I'm like, what just happened? Review your I didn't notes, scare Steve. you off, John. John, I'm harmless. Oh, Get back here. stop. <laughs> John didn't yeah, look like he was shaking. John didn't look scared. Did he, he just left. freeze? He froze. Oh, yeah, no, he's wrong, but he's not scared. Yeah, he's wrong. But. Does he have the right code to oh. get back in? Does he have... That's another thing I forgot to even mention. Challenge that he codes for that too. Indexly. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! Library this code. Is tragic. This is just starting to get it interesting. Is. I don't want to continue without him because I, now I feel I want to. I well, to we can't him. really. We don't have He'll the other side back. of the argument yet. He I mean, I can address what he said there. so far in my notes, but I want him to hear it. No. So he doesn't make <laughs> the same mistake again. Hold off on that. No, wait. He'll come back. John will come back in. I'm sure of it. Um. Uh, uh, we can. We, I bet he's still. Somebody easily. says I bet he's still talking. <laughs> he may uh, well right. be. Yeah, actually, he, I'll message him. You may not realize he. I'll message him. Yeah. Carl, you go uh, ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, the uh, the voting guys for the the Golden Nuns, which is a award show that we're going to be having on November the twenty fifth, is still going on. Uh, there's two more weeks left. You can go to uh, tinyurl.com slash golden nuns, or just click the link in the description and go and vote for your uh, favorite content creators. There's two different sections, one that's uh, YouTube wide and then one that is just uh, specifically for our show that you can vote for. Uh, the YouTube wide one you can fill in so it can be open to anybody. And then um, you just click the, uh, the multiple choice on the non sequitur versions of the, um, the, uh, the show. I looked at some of the results. Um, as much as we appreciate it and, and love you guys, um, there for about four days, we were winning the, the channel of the year. We cannot, uh, we, we cannot be in the running, but we do appreciate uh, oh, you uh, putting us out there like that. Yeah, it is. Um, but once again, the uh, link's in the description, so click that. And um, also our Discord. If you're not a member of our Discord, that's where a lot of these conversations continue on past, uh, after the show ends. You can come uh, check that out. There's a daily topic now that um, uh, Shadow does a good job of running so um check that out go be part of this go watch the dumpster fire sometimes that happen and um can we talk <laughs> about something while we still wait um I, there's a new there's a thing out there that i didn't know existed and that's the people that get angry when you when you ping them too many times on discord um, <laughs> i've had this conversation i've had this conversation i don't know how many times there is a there's a there's a certain set of people that every time you you hit the uh, at everyone Oh, really that's angry. a nightmare. And, yeah, no, that's the I reason I understand. turned off my Discord notification. I, I, you know what? I just told somebody to do that Thank today you. too, just to piss off the ad. Thank you. <laughs> I, I told somebody Thank just and then today. We, okay, I'll tell it, you what everybody. to do. Turn off your Discord notifications. Check your Discord a couple times a day. When you go to the app filter, so the app everyone's are <laughs> I'm out. back. And then you're done. Hey, oh, John's back. back. Hey, I, I told you guys he didn't run. You guys, like, oh, John ran. Steve, no, Steve. <laughs> now, I, now I'm back to realizing that it's you that I'm gonna have to ring. <laughs> All right, John, are you good? Are you ready? Yeah, I don't. I don't going? know what happened. Did I lose internet connection? Is that what happened? Yeah, oh, we don't know. So. You were just Crap. gone. You, you just, All right. you just stopped. All right. I'm notes, so you were, so go ahead. Oh, yeah. You were at premise so, of your syllogism. Premise two. Okay, so um, if we go to the next slide, most people. So most people know that the conclusion there is there's something fishy with that conclusion, right? If you know anything about biology, uh, and so they assume that one of the premises must be wrong. And most atheists have been saying that the first premise is wrong, and this is an argument that they've been using. I, I really think that all the people that are upset about calling the genetic code a code are upset because creationists said this to them and they didn't know how to respond. And so they've attacked the genetic code being a true code. <laughs> go, to the, go to the next slide here. That is wrong. That is, that is a mistake. The genetic code really is a code. Next slide. The, the real issue is that 
uh, their second premise is false. When they say that all codes that we know of were intelligently designed, that's where the error really is. And I'm going to go in today and um, talk a little bit about how it is that codes evolve, how it is that communication systems evolve. We go to the next slide here. Uh, next two slides, actually. But first, it's important to just kind of kind of talk about what a code is in general. So here I've got the the ASCII code. And again, uh, Steve is claiming that the ASCII code is not a code, which doesn't make any sense to me because this is what everybody considers to be codes. The ASCII code, the Morse code, and it's what Claude Shannon was studying when he was inventing the coding system for Bell, which he used. He, he digitized uh, audio so it could be sent over the phone. And he was, he was studying the, the uses of digital code that had been, had been used in computers before him. So he was looking at ASCII code, binary code. He was looking at Morse code. And he was looking at things like actual languages. So languages are codes. Uh, you can have, you can create keys that can cipher, act as a cipher for the code. So here we've got, you know, a really horrible cipher uh, table for English. You've got apple, cry, horse, shoes, plane, and little images that represent those. The really interesting thing to note here is that codes are roughly um, arbitrary. So in, in ASCII binary code, we've got A is represented by 1000001. But we could have chosen a different set of ones and zeros. And your keyboard communicates with your computer through binary code. When you hit A on your keyboard, it's sending a series of ones and zeros to your computer. Now, it's not actually sending ones and zeros. One means on, zero means off. So your computer is constantly counting. And when you hit A, it sends a little, little uh, jolt of electricity. And then it sends uh, a couple of null packets. So there's just, it's, it's not doing anything. Then it, then it sends that one again. And your computer is counting that up. And it, it reads that as 1000001. And it knows ahead of time, because it's been programmed to know this, that that means A. So it will display an A on your screen. In international Morse code, uh, these are the dots and dashes that we have decided upon in advance to, uh, to use. So A is a dot and a dash. So beep, beep. Uh, e is just a dot, and so on. And the point of Morse code is to send information through a wire. You can send uh, pulses of electricity through a wire. That can be read by a receiver and then decoded back into letters. So the purpose of a code is to encode information in a format that it can be transmitted across some sort of a medium. When we, when your, your keyboard takes the A button and turns that into ones and zeros, it can then easily transmit that through the wire. When uh, people using Morse code take, the, take an A and, and put it into a dot and a dash, they can easily transmit that through a wire. When you have a thought, you're thinking about an apple, you can encode that thought into a series of of vibration and move of your mouth. And that sound that you produce can be transmitted through the air into the ear of someone else. They can receive that in their ear and then decode it back into the thought of an apple. So you, you have information on both. You have this thought of an apple. You can encode that into some sort of a form that can then be transmitted. And then a receiver can decode that if they know the rules to decode it. And they will get that same image in their head that you had. So information is transferred through encoding and then decoding. Go to the next slide here. A code is a set of rules governing a communication system. This is how Claude Shannon describes it in his paper. Uh, he uses a lot more words than that, but th this, that's how he describes it in his, 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 one of his most famous papers, which we'll look at here in a second. So the code itself is the set of rules that govern a communication system. And to really understand what that means, we'll have to, we'll have to know what a communication system is. And we'll look at that here in a second. So we see that these charts that we're looking at, these are 
showing us what the rules are to these different communication systems. We see the ASCII code rules here. We see the Morse code rules here. We see a really short list of English rules here. Go to the next slide. This is the paper that Shannon wrote that really, really helped uh, kickstart the digital revolution. It's called the Mathematical Theory of Communication. And what he did is he, he was studying all these different codes that people had come up with. He figured out what it is they all have in common. And he described completely mathematically, he described how it is that codes work, how it is that communication systems work. And it's, it's a fairly long paper. It's a lot of math. <laughs> But he's actually pretty good at describing in between equations what's going on. And uh, this, him being able to articulate this, what it is that a code is, what it is that a communication system is, this absolutely changed the world. This allowed more and more people to get on board and start creating codes, started being able to create machines that could talk to other machines that allowed us to create massive amounts of digital information. So this is, this is thought to have given rise to the digital era that we now enjoy. Again, uh, you know, binary code, there was, there was a version of it that, it that was already invented, which is one of the things that he studied when he was producing this. But this was a major, major breakthrough in our understanding of, of what communication systems are. And this is actually really important in biology because when we look at biology, we realize that there are communication systems on top of communication systems, on top of communication systems in our cells, in different organisms. And the genetic code is just one of those communication systems. It's, it's at the basement of life. We go to the next slide here. This is his diagram that he created uh, showing what a communication system is in its most abstract form. So we've got an information source and then that information is transmitted. There, there has to be a transmitter. And some people call this uh, an encoder. Um, vocabulary is constantly changing, unfortunately. And across different fields, it changes as well, which is always a problem when we had uh, discussions like this. But so if we, think about, if we think about a person that has an idea of an apple and they want to transmit that to someone else, you know. Eat, the purpose of a communication system is to get information from one point to another point. And to do that, if you have an idea of an apple, you have to encode that in some sort of a, a way that can be transmitted to your receiver, the person that you want to talk about an apple to. And the way that we do that uh, in spoken language is, again, through moving our mouth and pumping air through our voice box and so on. And if the person speaks the same language as us, if they know the same rules to the code that we're encoding that message in, the receiver on the other end can receive that information. And Claude Shannon talks a lot about noise. So uh, between the transmitter and the receiver here, we have a channel. And in, in spoken English, that channel is the air. He talks a lot about noise because he was his his big thrust was how to how to avoid noise in the system. You know, if there's noise in a room. You have to be able to communicate through that if there's a lot of wind or whatever. And there's also noise in a wire that when you're, when you're delivering information through a wire, when you're transmitting information through a wire, you have to deal with noise. So he focused a lot on that. Then you have a receiver, and that receiver decodes that message into the thought of an apple. Go to the next slide here. So here's kind of a, a simplified version with, with language that's it's more common today. Um, a lot of times we'll talk about the, the transmitter being the, the encoder. So up at the top here, I have kind of an abstract example of, of a communication system. You've got an encoder. That encoder um, encodes information and into a message. That message is transmitted to a decoder, and that decoder decodes that message. And code or languages govern how it is that that message is written, the rules by which that message is written. So we have a keyboard here. Uh, the keyboard is the encoder. You know, you're actually the source of the message. You're, you press the, the letter A, and it encodes that into ones and zeros. It transmits that through the wire to the CPU and your computer. 
and your computer then decodes that into the letter A, which it displays on the screen. Another example of this, I've got me, and I've, I'm, I'm using the rules of blueprinting. I have created a message of a house. I'm going to send that to a contractor, and he's going to decode that message into a house. So the house is the decoded message in this example. And then finally, we have the genetic code. You've got a stretch of DNA. That is, a message is produced from that DNA, is, is encoded into RNA. That RNA then meets up with the ribosome, and the ribosome is a special molecule in our cells that decodes messages in RNA, and it decodes them into proteins. So what you could say here is that the genome, the gene is telling the ribosome how to build a protein. And it uses the genetic code to do that. The genetic code is the set of rules that the genome uses to communicate with the ribosome. To the next slide here. So, yeah, questions from anyone. Um, I, I don't have any questions. I, I mean, I've got reputations for everything you've just said. I've taken notes, but uh, I'm going to wait till you're done with your presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Are there any live chat questions for clarification? Kyle, did you see any live no, chat questions? No, I know what his argument. I mean, I, 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 I don't have any questions. I know what his argument is. That's I don't. I. I there was one that, okay. said, that asked if uh, the Nazis uh, enigma. Would he consider the Nazis enigma a cipher or a code? That's a cipher. It's one that I've. It's it's one it's one symbol. So, um, I mean, it's a symbol that we understand. So it's a, uh, yeah. The, the way that the Enigma machine worked is you had, the Enigma machine had to be set up exactly from one specific condition for the wheels. There was trillions of different combinations it had. And so even if the, the allies or the enemy or whatever got a hold of this machine, they wouldn't know the initial configuration to do the algorithm. Cause this is for what a cipher is. If you know the algorithm, like that Caesar shift, where you just like say, shift one to the left, each letter, you know how to decipher it. But that's what the Enigma machine did. But you had to know the initial configuration of it. That was a cipher, not a code. So, um, still... sorry, what's that? Do you still have more for your presentation? You still have more? Well, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got, I've got quite a bit more. But I, I, I guess I want to understand. Um, so, you think that? What is the difference between um, encryption and coding in your mind? Okay, so well, let me let me let me kind of go through your thing, and 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 I'll get to that. Um, so, it, if you're talking about a digital code, it, uh, digital, it is definitely digital, right? Um, it's not an analog component to this. Digital means discrete. So we're talking about the Shannon information of bits, which is like zero 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 one one zero one one. That's clearly digital. Agreed. So when yeah. Dawkins is talking about that, that's what he's referring to. Those four symbols, the A, T, G, and C, which is the genetic code that. We agree. We both agree that part is a code. Those symbols are can be re represented via Shannon information by by two bits. That's why it's digital. That's why he calls it digital. Um, yeah, he calls uh, it. He calls it a quaternary. He calls it. Dawkins calls quaternary. it a quaternary code. Yeah. Right. Specifically, right. he calls but it a quaternary code. C O D E. Right. Yeah, but <laughs> as I as I explained, heuristically, we we use language. With, with these words because there are limitations on how we express things. Just because something used a word code does not necessarily, in strict definition, make it a code. It's a way to explain things by use of analogy. I need to interrupt for a second for, to, to, to get both of you to clarify something for the sake of me sure. and everybody in the audience. Yeah. What is the difference between a cipher and a code? It is very concisely so that we can he, he make can go sure first that. And, and then if he wants. Do you want to explain that, and then I'll explain it? Well, um, I, I, it, from my I'm, perspective, it looks like there's some magic to hear what you think. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious to, to hear. I'm curious to see what you think because because uh, it seems semantic to me. No, they're not. There, a lot of people use the terms interchangeably, Why? and they're not. It's especially like encode or encrypt. They use them interchangeably. Why? That's not. To encrypt means to go through an algorithm. Um, a code is this again. A very. This is what a true code is. I take a primary symbol, like the word car, and I want to convey mm -hmm. that to, to Shannon. And I want her to know, um, oh, excuse me, the, the, excuse me I'm, let me start again. The word nuclear weapon, I want to convey to her a nuclear weapon. And I don't want John to know what the hell I'm talking about. Like he doesn't now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, but I, so I want to take that and I want to convert it to a code. And I say, okay, 
the word I'm going to use, which is conveying meaning, codes convey some kind of meaning, like the word car has some kind of meaning, right? It's readable. So it's by your like definition, symbol, are all codes like linguistic? All codes, all have codes to be are semantically linguistic. linguistic. Yes, all all codes are, are semantically linguistic. Um, so it's so all I about transmitting through. an image or some I, sort of information. So right, if, the, if something exactly. isn't linguistic, it by your definition can't be a code because codes only exist linguistically. Right. That symbol. That's those three letters. C A R represent the one symbol, one object that represents nuclear weapon. In order to you to know what the hell I'm talking about, you need that code book that says car equals nuclear weapon. In the days of, so, of it's this is what from, the, so it's about transcription. So it's a okay. So it's about transcription from the initial item you would transcribe that into into something and then the ob something else right. the, the object is for me to use some sort of cipher in order to be able to enter into my cognition that no. that's what that, that that's what you're trying to transmit no to you me. don't I use the cipher do. you don't use a cipher so you would, need a code book so this is for example, example uh, uh, i'll give you an example, give you example. <laughs> right. see this I'll is why you so semantic so but if it's only but, but it's linguistic not. It's not. So let okay. me give you an example. Why not? If I if I want if I wanted to, if I if back in the day it cost money to send things through telephony. It was very costly, right? And so mm -hmm. instead of having a long sentence that meant something, if I want they used uh, in in accounting they would say like you you know bounce the books for this this whatever, okay? Instead of writing out bounce the books for it, they would have yeah, they would have one word and that one word would be like quaternary. And I think quaternary was one of the words they used in the code book. So if the receiver had that word quaternary, they knew what it meant to be like in the exact phrase. It's a way of shortening it down. That's what a code okay. is. Okay. A cipher so, is different. A cipher, again, is a one-to-one, -one cor uh, excuse me, a bit correspondence to one letter to one thing. For example, uh, C-A-R, if I, if I shift those one to the left, I'll end up with D-B-S, right? So that's, that's a, a, a ciphering. Right, and if I want to decipher it, I just have to know the algorithm. And the algorithm is shift each letter to the left. I don't need a code book. I just have to know the algorithm, the key it's called. That's the huge difference. A code book is, is so, very big, but an algorithm and cipher is just, what is it? Shift to the left. So the, me the difference is the method of encoding and the method of decryption. Correct. So, yeah, word, yeah, encoding it's, is it's the same thing. A word, word, a word level. To me, that seems to make sense. Is individual letter. That's, there's a huge difference yeah. there. If I want to encode something, I'm going to encode there's a word. Actually if not. If I want to cipher, I cipher each letter at a time. All right. All right. Okay. John. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. John, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah. I just want, for the sake of my sanity and everybody in the chats, I just needed to get and, that and out I, of the I way. Want to, I want to clarify one other point. Because I'm using that for code, it actually does work as well for cipher. Cipher is in, in some ways linguistically as well. The problem is, is that neither one of these by all definitions, are either a code or a cipher. They're pseudocode, pseudocipher. Uh, it really depends, again, what definitions you want to use for these things. So in any true form, it's not even, DNA is not even a true cipher in that regard either, um, but it's close enough. Uh, in my, I think it's more closer to a cipher than a code. All right, so you're saying, John, 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 you're saying the genetic code, you're saying the genetic code is a cipher, not a code. And that binary code is a cipher, not a code. And that Morse code is a cipher, not a code. Yes. And ASCII is a cipher okay. as well. So all the things that com computer scientists call uh, codes, they're wrong. It, according it, it, to it's you. just stuck. It's, it's just a term that's stuck. It's one of those. Okay. There's a lot of things in science that people st had bad terminology <laughs> that just stuck. We call it the Big Bang. It's not a bang, right? right. So, uh, so the people that invented code were wrong for calling it code. No. The people that no, invented and named it originally were wrong until you came here and corrected them. You, this is validatable. Anybody can go validate on Google. We have something called Google now. Go look it up. Morse code, ASCII, not a code. Go, go look at Morse code. I have, I, have, I have different pages of Morse code. They call it a, a cipher. And, it, and they, some of them call it the Morse code cipher. So there is, re, um, there is evidence for this. I'm not just like pulling this out of my, you know, Heister here. So, but but uh, I want to address, I want to address his uh, syllogism. Heister doesn't mean Heister, Steve. Heister doesn't mean Heister, all right? Listen, we're going to go to John because, because he, hasn't, uh, he hasn't been on his Sure. Uh, yes, so, but so, I do have other things so, I, I right, want to okay. address for them. Yeah. So the most important okay, thing with 
with understanding is, and I, again, the only reason that people think that genetic code is not a code, except for you who are, you are a special case, the only person in the world that doesn't accept codes as being codes. Aside from uh, that, that was rhetorical. Hold on, hold on. We're going to let you respond. Go ahead, John. You'll get a chance to. I can't mute Steve for the record. <laughs> uh, aside, oh, aside, from, <laughs> aside from Steve not accepting the definitions of computer science and Claude Shannon, um, you know, if, if we look at the people who invented these codes, they call them codes, um, and they have since the start. All of these codes. Uh, the reason that the reason that many atheists have an issue with with this is because of this creationist argument. For some reason, atheists think that because creationists make an argument, we should throw away our language and <laughs> stop calling the genetic code a code. I do not agree with this. The again, the, the actual issue with that creationist argument is the second uh, claim that they make. Their second premise when they say that all codes that we know of were intelligently designed. That is false. It is true that, that the genetic code is a code, but it's not true that all codes are intelligently designed. And so if we go to the next slide, we're going to look at some codes that have evolved. Uh, there is a field of biology called signaling theory of evolutionary biology, uh, which studies the evolution of communication systems. And it turns out that every time you get symbiosis to evolve between two organisms, you also get the evolution of a new communication system. So here on the left, I've got, we've got a goby and a shrimp. This is a pistol shrimp. I don't know if you know the story about these guys, but the, the shrimp is really good at digging, but it doesn't have very good eyesight. And they'll team up with a goby. They'll, they'll dig in this nice burrow. They'll live in it together. And when the two go out to get food, they actually eat different foods. The goby mainly eats meat and the shrimp mainly eats algae. They'll go out looking around for food. And when something dangerous comes by, the, the goby will signal by wiggling its tail that there's a danger, and the shrimp and the goby will both go back into their little cave. And there's a, there's a lot of complicated communication that's going on between these two organisms. Uh, it's really cool because you can actually get these in your aquarium, and you can study it at home. Like, they actually sell these at the pet store. <laughs> it's amazing. Bacteria also have very complex communication systems, uh, which we'll talk about here. Uh, they do, among other things, something called quorum sensing, where they send out communication molecules uh, just to basically say, hey, I'm present. And the other bacteria can, can receive that, and they can get a sense of how many other bacteria there are in the population. And the reason that I bring this up is that there is no thinking involved here. Communication does not have to involve thinking. It does not have to involve a brain. The shrimp and the goby, they both have brains. We're used to inventing communication systems with our brains. Someone just sat down and invented binary code. Someone just sat down and invented Morse code. But communication systems and the codes that, that govern them can actually, a code being the set of rules governing a communication system, these things can evolve. And I'll actually talk about how this evolved in bacteria, but. Uh, these bacteria, once they have received enough signals from their neighbors, you know, once, once there's a lot of signals hitting them, certain genes inside their genome will turn off and others will turn on and they'll start changing their behavior. And they'll do things in a group that are better to do in a group than alone. They'll, like, they'll excrete digestive enzymes, for example. Um, and as a group, they'll excrete all these digestive enzymes at the same time and that'll allow them to accomplish more together than they could have ever done alone. And they wait until the time is right, and they use this communication system to figure out when that time is right. Here, we've got golden jackals. Golden jackals, like all dogs, have an extremely complicated communication system that is molecular-based. Uh, you seem to be stuck on um, symbols having to be letters or something like that, but symbols can be anything. These dogs are using... Okay. Uh, these dogs are using molecules in their urine to communicate to each other. And they're communicating all sorts of complicated things to each other when they're in heat. Um, uh, uh, if they're in heat, they're communicating whether or not they're actually available. Uh, they're all sorts of things they're communicating, not just by the molecules that are in their urine, but also how, they, how they're marking in different areas. A very complicated communication system that's studied by people who are studying the evolution of codes 
and communication in biology. And then finally, we've got the black bear, which I'll talk about on the next slide here. So how do communication systems evolve? In signaling theory, communications start out with cues, and those eventually evolve into legitimate signals. And this is an example from my childhood. Um, I'm going to start out with an example from two, two thinking creatures. So we're going to use our brains to invent a communication system. And then we'll talk about how communication systems can evolve between things that don't know how to think at all. They don't have that ability to think at all. But when I was a kid, I used to go camping a lot. I was a Boy Scout. And we were told that there's bears in one of the areas that I was, I was camping at. And it turns out that bears are scared of humans. They avoid humans if they know that humans are around. But if you surprise them, if you just happen to, across a bear, a lot of times it will attack you because it's scared. So they've got this fight or flight response. If you're close enough, they'll fight you. If you're far enough, they'll run away. So the bear wants to run away from you. It does not want to interact with you. But if you're just walking through the woods quietly, like you normally would, you can end up getting killed by a bear. So we were told to signal to the bear that we were present. And we would do this by singing when we were walking in the woods. We would do this by talking. Um, some people would put bells on their shoes, things like that. There are different ways that you can signal to the bear that you're there. And that will allow the bear to run away. Now, when all organisms, all things are constantly putting off cues that they exist. So um, I'm right now, I'm making noise and another organism that might be in the room could hear that noise and get that cue and hide from me. Maybe there's a spider in the room with me. I'm not trying to communicate with spiders in my room right now. I'm communicating with you guys. So what I, this, the, these things that I'm sending out, this noise that I'm making to the spider, that is considered a cue. The spider picks up on it, but I'm not sending it on purpose. Someone walking through the woods, their footsteps are a cue to the bear. The bear can pick up on that, but the person just walking through the woods isn't actually sending a signal. They're just accidentally emitting cues. Um, predators can use cues to hunt their prey. So it's the, there's nothing intentional about sending out a cue. When uh, a sender starts doing it on purpose, when a sender starts actually trying to communicate with the other entity, then we call it a signal. And in biology, um, we call it a signal when, uh, when the sender starts magnifying the cue because they're getting some sort of survival benefit from it. Uh, is, that, is that clear? So the difference between a cue and a signal, is that clear? Okay, Steve, we'll go to the next, next slide here. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for so, my, my, my rebuttal. Yeah. I know. So Steve, you're patient. You're so, doing good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> so how is it? So how is it that communication systems evolve between things that can't think? You know, I, I was able to develop a communication system with a bear because someone taught me how. So I used my brain to do that, and the brain's using uh, the bear's using his brain to figure out, you know, what to what to make of these signals that are being sent his way as well. Well, in bacteria, it turns out when we study the the communication system in bacteria. It's very clear that the molecule that they send out is actually just a waste product. It's their, it's their urine, essentially. Something that they're just trying to get rid of. Uh, they don't want it in their body. Other bacteria uh, evolved a receptor that could receive that, receive that urine. We'll just call it urine. It's not actually urine, but receive that molecule. And when it would receive that molecule, they would change their behavior. We now see that uh, these things are actually producing these waste materials on purpose. They're actually producing more than they need. They're actually burning calories to produce these faster than they otherwise would be. And because of that, we, we now call it a signal. These, these bacteria, you could say, are doing it on purpose. They've, they've, evolved, uh, a, they've evolved the ability to enhance their signal. And so we call it a true signal now. And it turns out that bacteria actually have a fairly complex, some of them have a fairly, fairly complex collection of signals and fairly complex reaction to those signals that they send and receive to one another. And this entire, all of this is happening without a brain. 
all of this is happening simply because of dissent with modification acted upon by natural selection. Communication systems evolve every time two or more evolving entities have selection pressure to cooperate. And when there is selection pressure and two evolving entities, the communication system will emerge. It will, it will evolve. Or I should say it can evolve because it's also possible that two organisms live right next to each other and never end up having the right mutations to even know that the other is there. But these are, this is the, these, are, these are the circumstances in which a communication system can evolve. Furthermore, once you have organisms that can think, uh, they can actually use their brains to develop communication systems much faster than the slow process of evolving a communication system the way that bacteria have to do. But that is signaling theory kind of in a nutshell. And this is how codes evolve. Again, a code is the set of rules that govern a communication system. And next slide here. Uh, this is just <laughs> more on dogs. We're all very well, well aware. I, I just want to drive home the, the fact that a, a uh, symbol in a communication system does not have to be a letter. It can, act, it can be a molecule. Um, one of the symbols, uh, there are many symbols in a dog communication system, and they can, they can smell those molecules. They can, they can get all sorts of information. Is the dog in heat? Is the dog bigger than me? Um, and so forth. They can actually recognize each other by these molecules that are in their urine. And again, those molecules, those molecules aren't a dog in heat. Those molecules are symbols saying that this dog is in heat. It's not, a, it's not an actual dog in heat. It is truly a symbol that the dog can understand. So that's why Your when you take them out on a walk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. They, their, their, their Facebook, their Twitter is smelling the bush that some other dog peed on. So. Be nice to your dogs and let them sniff that bush next time you take them that out for a walk. so much like I, I'm all in so the bush this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but he's lots not allowed on Twitter. Is it right. it's it's lots does, of that, does that wrap? Mm -hmm. Is that? Do you have any more slides? Uh, the next slide. What's the next slide? I've actually got. Oh, oh, here's so we're running low on here's time a, and I want to I, 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 I feel like I've, I've yeah. talked to Jensen. Next slide. Yes. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. Steve, you well, do the same slide. thing. Is that wait, yeah, are we getting it. close to I want to be able to yeah, have yeah. back and forth between I, us. Okay. I can end it here, but I've got another section where I talk about translation and transcription, all that stuff, but he already kind of went over that. So Yeah. Um, and we can get to that in the back and forth. So Yeah, perfect. This is just I want I want everybody to know. I want everybody to know that the, this book right here, Behavioral Ecology, is the best book to start if you want to learn how communication systems evolve. And uh, this, that book is expensive, though. It's a textbook. This paper right here that I'm showing on screen, which I can't read on. Uh, hold on. Ha, I've got it here, too. Um, that's a really good paper that gives a good overview. It's called uh, Evolution Theory of Bacterial Quorum Sensing. When is a signal not a signal? And actually, this is a, a paper by Stuart West where he was just correcting um, the, the use of other biologists. Uh, they were misusing signaling theory and not understanding it properly. And this, this he corrects them. And well, actually, Stuart West didn't, didn't write it. He was one of the authors on it. It's a really good paper that describes what signaling theory is at its core in biology. So. And that's free. You can just Google that and find it. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. So we're running oh, yeah. low on I'm, time. I'm done. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's not a lot of time for formal rebuttals, and I really want to see the interaction back and forth as you guys ask questions. I, I, I'm going to try to argue. I got to address that. I know, Steve. I know. Just let me finish the sentence, and I promise you we can go. <laughs> so, so I may interrupt if I feel you're talking past each other so that I can help sort of translate to the audience, but mostly I'm going to let you guys kind of have a back and forth and Kyle um, will interrupt if we have any super chats that need to be read because those take precedence because those people are kind enough to pay to have the opportunity to ask a question. So I will interrupt you for that or if I feel like you're talking over each other and nobody can understand what you're saying. So Steve, I will let right. you take the floor first because I know you're about to die. <laughs> so, so please go ahead. Steve. No, not, um, not at all because I, I, I think the last 10 minutes. I'm proud of you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> 
it, it's funny he's mentioned things like quorum sensing. We actually have a PhD that did their thesis on quorum sensing, and so we've talked about it before. Quorum sensing, as I understand it, is basically if you have a certain amount of chemical that's in the system, like for aspergillus or some kind of bacteria, then it'll signal some kind of uh, thing through a, a pathway, such as like uh, G, what is it, um, G protein coupled receptors, right? And I actually did a video on this a long time ago on those very same things. So I, I, that is information that has nothing to do with the code. I think what's happening is you're confusing information and signaling because quorum sensing deals with signaling of those G-coupled protein receptors. Those are not a code, though. Um, the code is, is how I've, I've explained the code to be. And when you go back a little bit earlier about the ID argument, I'm not arguing from an ID position, and I don't care how the IDers argue it. Um, codes generally do come from intelligence. Now, again, that's only by strict definition. You can take a more loose definition. But the reason there are, the codes come from an intelligence is because the sender and the receiver have to be able to communicate what the message is. And the only way you do that is you give them a code book, right? Um, so there is an understanding. Just because a syllogism is true, if, that doesn't mean it's convincing. So even if it's the case that a code is by an intelligent mind, it doesn't get you to an intelligent designer because it's just by definition. It's not a convincing argument. For a good argument, you need to be logically valid. It needs to be sound. The premises have to be true. And it needs to be convincing. Argument by definition is not very convincing. So I don't care what the ideas think. Um, the other things I, I noted here, um, Deidre Wilson and, and wrote some things on this language is not a code. Um, they actually said coded com coded communication works best when the emitter and receiver share exactly the same code. Any difference between the emitter and sender's code is a possible source of error in the communication process. That's why each has a code book that they use. Quote, human language is not a code. True codes have a one-to-one -one course a relationship with meaning. And that meaning is, is in, what's important here. One-to-one -one relationship with meaning. When I convey that that car is supposed to represent nuclear weapon, there's meaning there, right? There's no meaning by just a symbol inherent to that symbology. And you talked about how it's not symbols. Yes, it's semiotics. And semiotics is literally dealing with symbols. So when you're talking about codes, you're dealing with symbology, right? What you're doing, is you're taking Shannon's information theory and you're inappropriately relating it to symbology because you're saying there's information in the system. There's information by which these, these um, Animals communicate with each other. Yes, they have chemical and pheromones they released, and they communicate with each other. Um, but the, you're, I think you're using the word code so loosely that it applies to literally anything at that point. I'm using it in a very specific way. So when you're, you're talking about um, all these things like quorum sensing, I don't see how it relates in any way, shape, or form to, to the topic of a DNA as a code. Let's assume there are natural codes. I'm not going to argue either way on that. I'm, I'm agnostic on that particular point of view. But if it is oh, the case God. that that if it is the case that it requires an intelligence, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't help the ID argument at all. It's not a convincing argument to me. Does that make sense, Steve? You, you Steve, you have okay. somebody, uh, and this will. Uh, uh, let me just break in real quick because there's a super chat that kind of um, is it's relevant to what uh, Steve just said. It said, uh, Steve, do you have a specific definition of code that you use? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, I have a couple, um, and this is the problem. It depends on what definition you use. He's arguing a specific <laughs> thing that definitely, you know, I'm, I'm saying Does it depends it, what you it, use. It even one of those couple? If you have a couple. Yeah. There's a couple. Does, yeah. Does, uh, okay. The, the main one is this. A system does of what words, John letters, is talking. Go ahead. Does what John's explaining fit any of those couple no. definitions? Well, yes. In the same way by which a legal code is. Ah! He's talking about. <laughs> hang on, hang on, a legal code. But we're not talking. <laughs> you say. D is DNA a code like a legal code? A code means something you have to abide by doing. You have to obey the law because there's a codification of the law, right? It's codified. That's a completely different meaning. That's an equivocation problem there because that's not what we're talking about in symbiotics. That's not what we're talking about in information theory nor in cryptography. It's a completely different meaning of the word. So he's meaning by which something has to be, be a signal to do something or an abidance by which you have to obey something. Um, one of the things the definition for code is um, uh, programming instructions, right? Or a system, a collection of laws, statutes, um, or this one, a set of conventions or moral principles governing behavior in a, moral, in a particular sphere. DNA doesn't apply to any of those things, right? So we're asking if DNA is a code that has nothing to do with those definitions. And I think he's using right. a, a weird definition that doesn't apply when it comes to DNA. 
I am using Claude like Shannon's definition of a code, which is that a code is a set of rules governing a communication system. That is what a code is. And that is what the genetic okay. code is. But that's, but that's the problem. That's like saying the legal system is a set of code by which we have to obey ourselves in society. Therefore, DNA is a code, and it's a legal code. No, it's not. These are completely different meanings of the word. I think you're equivocating on this grossly, a matter of fact, because Claude Shannon was not a biologist. He's talking about information system, and I don't think he ever argued DNA was a code. Matter of fact, again, Crick himself argued it's not a code, and he's a biologist. He's the one that discovered the structure yeah. of DNA. Yeah, Crick doesn't understand communication systems. That's why he didn't know that, but Richard Dawkins was a DNA. computer DNA's programmer. Biology. Hold on, Steve. Richard Dawkins yeah, was a computer a programmer and a biologist, and so Richard Dawkins understood perfectly well that the genetic code is a code. That's why he wrote an entire I, I, chapter. I don't think that's what he said. That. I, I think you're reading yeah. it incorrectly. Um, it, it's digital format. You can read it. Again, There's a PDF I have online. It. It's free. I have read it. I have read it. But again, I think, I think that you're seeing the word code, and you're not taking heuristically. You're not taking it as an ana analogy a lot of times. Um, again, the only thing that's actually a code in cryptography would be that ATC in G letters. That's what a code means. And I think you're just throwing everything, information, uh, sender, receiver. By the way, even with a sender and receiver, when you do coding, we create the sender and receiver to understand something. So even if computer sends to a computer, it took an intelligence to make that computer understand the other computer in that regard. Yeah. You're saying, you I use, just, wait, one sec, you, one, sec, one sec, you use the analogy that a ribosome is an agent recently, right, on Facebook, which I didn't understand because a ribosome is not an agent. It's not, it's not, it's, it can be a receiver for information, but it, it cannot be an agent the way Claude was, Claude Shannon was classifying as an agent because he used the term agent, meaning agency, meaning an intelligence or human being from sender to receiver, two people communicating. That's that was from his wrong. paper. That's no, from his wrong. paper. No, no, no. From his paper, he says it could be a person or a thing no, can be the no, receiver. The transmitter could, no, you're incorrect. The transmitter could be a thing. The transmitter could be a thing. The agent. Want me to pull up the paper? I, I can pull yes, up the paper. Yes, I've read it. All right. It's Let me pull it up for you. Um, oh my goodness! All right. Things are getting heated. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Is DNA a code? Is it not a code? What definition of code are we using to, to decide if DNA is a code? Okay, well, on, on page two, by, uh, on page two, and you didn't have to read very far. He says that the destination is the person or thing for whom the message is intended. The destination, okay, in this particular case, the destination, right? The destination is the, <laughs> uh, 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 like a receiving, a not the agent, but like a computer, right? That's the destination, but who created the computer? You're, you're, you're saying that, that the destination, the, look, at, look okay. what it says for send and receiver. I, re I read what you're re reading. Read what it says for right, the agent. Let me, let, me read, let me read the receiver. Let's read the receiver. Is, is, is the, the receiver ordinarily, ordinarily performs the inverse operation of that done by the transmitter, reconstructing the message from the signal. Right. Exactly. But who, who, the, the agents that he's talking about are the people, right? You don't say that a computer is an agent. Why does it have to be people? Why does it have to be people? Why does it have to be people? Because when you no, use he, the word agent, that implies agency, the ability to think on your own, right? A computer doesn't do that. We have to establish the format by which a computer receives something. Could you or be imbuing that meaning onto his paper, though? Like, could you be imbuing no, that I've meaning asked, onto I've it actually, based I've, on I've, your I've, understanding? I, I, no, I've, act, I've asked people about this. I've, I've actually asked. Are you from authority? Um, but yes. I've, I've, yes, yes, Kyle. Yeah. Kyle Kyle's on yeah. top. I, of I, I will, I, and I will, I will. I say that because you know, I mean, but this I've is heavy duty people, stuff. But you have to have an intent here. You have to have an agency, right? There, if if I want to communicate something to Shannon, there's an intentionality there for me to say I need her to understand my message, right? There's nothing between the right. ribosome and the DNA that has that intentionality. So you're saying, in order for there to be okay. a code, there needs to be intent from the sender. In the strictest sense of the word, I think so, yes. Okay. Well, now, I don't want to get into the, an argument of teleology here, but what we find when we study the origin of life is that as soon as you have descent with modification acted upon by natural selection, nature selects for things that are good at surviving and reproducing. And when you look at them do their thing, it looks like they're doing it on purpose. It looks like they have purpose. It looks like they have intent. Things, things can evolve. I mean, you and I are evolved creatures, so our intents are actually um, evolved intents. 
uh, much of them, uh, the base, the base intentions that we have. The the gene is trying. I mean, the gene is holding information that is to be sent out to the ribosome, so the ribosome can decode it into a protein. And the whole purpose of this is survival and reproduction. So. Uh, Okay. Well, the, pro the problem I have with that is you're, you're, you're trying to relate, like you said, teleonometry, teleonomics with teleology, right? Um, the teleology would be something of uh, an agency that designs something. The, but teleonomics doesn't yeah, require we're that. Not topic, but... Well, yeah, but this is interesting. The nature can design something, right? But that doesn't mean it has to have an actual agency. There's no agency in teleonomics. That's what Darwin was brilliant in pointing out, that natural selection can do this without intentionality, without agency. That's why Darwin's was was so unique for the time because everybody at the time thought it was theologically um, uh, only. They only thought theology would be the only way this could operate, this could work. And he said, "No, we have something that has the appearance of agency, but it's not agency. Yes. It's not intentionality, right?" And so, well, when, when you're talking about this, the, the the things that you're looking at, you're, you're making the same mistake I think the intelligent design advocates are making because there is no intentionality there. There's no intent. No, no. What I'm saying is that it's not it's not true intention. There's no there's no being on top of it telling things that, that want stuff to happen. Right. The intent, right. if you want to call it intent, evolved because these are the sorts of things that evolution does. It produces these sorts of things. So uh, the fact that you th you think that it needs to be a person that that is communicating code is just wrong. I mean it says right here, person or thing, so. literally in black and white on right. the page, right here. I, I understand, uh, but as I as I as I've tried to explain, time, I, 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 and by the way, I did say or thing. I've read the, I read it before, so I knew what it said. A thing. That's why I asked the experts. Jesus or Christ. thing is, is the fact that you have a computer, which is the thing designed by a higher agency, right? We designed that thing, so it still requires some kind of inten yeah. intentionality behind it. You're just looking at it and going, mm -hmm. oh, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a human. That's true, but who designed the computer? I just so explained really... to you. Sorry. I just explained say, to you that you bacteria can communicate. Has agency. Steve, like, do you think that finish. he just started talking? I never said. I never said that a ribosome has agency. Today, like I don't know if no, no but I said Jeff that prior. And... Oh my God, okay. Dave Prior, prior said that, and so I was <laughs> okay. kind of confused. So we're gonna have think to, that. All right. So so that. let's talk about the agency that a ribosome has. Then, if that's what you want to talk about, so. The ribosome itself, the only it can only do one thing. Uh, within a specific environment, it can only do one thing. It can only do what it's what it's evolved to do, which is to uh, take a messenger RNA and convert that into a protein. That's what it can do. But across generations, you could say it has agency because mutations can slightly tweak it, and natural selection will then select for versions that that are better at surviving and, repro and reproducing. The differences that exist in the genetic code, you talked about this earlier. What is one of your arguments to say that the genetic code is not really a genetic code is that there's different versions of the genetic code in different organisms. That's true. There's also different versions of binary code. You know, we use ASCII code, that's the American standard code, but there's other versions of binary code. These are just different, the rules are different. A code, again, is the set of rules that govern a communication system. That's what we're talking about when we talk about code. And computer science. Yeah, uh, that, that's the, the, that's the equivocation problem. And by the way, uh, agency by definition requires a consciousness. Okay, you have to Steve, have a consciousness to have agency. Steve, let it, he let him. Okay, go ahead, John, and then I will throw it to Steve. Finish finish your thought, John, and then so, I'll throw it to Steve. Again. Okay, let's let's not use agency because you don't like that word. Let's say degrees of freedom. The only degrees of freedom that that a ribosome has are those that accumulate across generations through mutation. Uh, the genetic okay. code can change across generations through mutation. Um, and it, it's, it's mutations in tRNA will cause a change in the genetic code. That's how new dialects evolve. Uh, new versions of the genetic code evolve through mutations in transfer RNA. That's how they evolve. Um, and if anyone wants uh, a more in-depth explanation of how TNR, tRNA works and the ribosome, the whole translation system, I did a video yesterday, actually, um, on this, on the Stated Casually channel. And I've got a video on the Stated Clearly channel called What is DNA and How Does It Work? But um, you're, you're just trying to explain the, 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 the redundancy, the, the degeneracy of the, of the code on itself, right? You're, try, you're trying to explain why, why um, different 
species may code for a different amino acid, right? Yeah. And so our different, mitochondria, for example, and why you might have three code with three letters code for a different amino acid. Because right. the rules again, the rules well, that that's govern through, the that's through evolution. The, yeah. the rules, the that, rules govern, that govern right. the communication system will evolve yeah. Rule, slightly. Yes. Rules rules as a code is only the one of the most loosest definitions. But again, we have rules in law. Yeah. We have a codification yeah, of law. That's not how we use the it's terminology. The definition, when it comes to DNA. the definition used by Claude Shannon in communication theory. So yeah. if you don't like it, yeah. that's fine. I mean that's I mean, what people may, are talking about when they talk about code. To, like you said, like uh, an instruction set is is a set of code, right? Um, how to do something, but this is not how any biologist that I've talked to, and I've talked to a numer three biologists with PhDs so far. None of them use it this way. So I mean, if Claude and none Shannon of them understand was communication in, theory, but Richard well, Dawkins I, I, does, I which is why he wrote an entire chapter on it. All right, I, I think they kind of do. Back to the Steve, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, I'm good. I'm done. All right, Steve. You're good? Okay. You're done? Okay. I have a question. Right, I, I, oh, Kyle, do you have a super chat or anything? Because if not, I have a question. No, I was just I was just gonna um, I was gonna let Steve finish up his point. I didn't know he was finished with his uh, his thought. Um, so go ahead, Shannon. Okay. So here's my question. I think this is kind of an all important question. So essentially, Steve, what you're saying is just definitionally, but by, by the by the stringent or strict definition because colloquially i think you would agree that a lot of people would say d that the genetic code is a code that's why it's called a code Col so colloquially based on you know a general understanding a lot of people would and john would probably argue that even more than that it would he would expound upon that 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 more people would even uh, on a finite level would would call it a code because you take information that information is transmitted and deciphered and ends up in something that is predictable based on how the letter sequences appear. So like how the, if the letter sequences appear in a certain way, like CTAG, you will, you will see something, a protein, be produced consistently because it's translated into that protein consistently. So like that to me, that sounds like a code and I'm not, I'm no biologist. You essentially, it seems like a semantic argument to my mind to my to my sad little non-biologist mind that it would that it's not a code it's essentially what you would call a cipher so it's just it's just a, a minor shift in definitional terms you would probably say it's not minor but for somebody like me from the outside looking in that seems like a minor semantic shift in definitional terms that might be moderately frustrating. <laughs> I, I'm using it. In, I'm, I'm, I know I, I got. What you're, I'm gleaning what you're saying. I groke. Um, okay. I'm using the most strictest forms of of, of terms here. But I, I have to ask you: when you say ge the genetic code is a code, what do you mean by genetic code? I mean the the question. chart of code. No, what is she? The genetic mean code is the, these. She, oh. I, no, hang on. I'm not, I, she asked the question, so I want to know what she means by you because she said. If you ask anybody if the genetic code is a code, well, when you say like that, what do you mean by the genetic code? But what is the when genetic I code? What, I'm not talking He's about He's saying it's the, it's the codon chart. So when the RNA goes through the ribosome, the RNA, the, the, the letter sequence on the RNA is being read by the ribosome, and the ribosome is turning that into a protein. And it's turning it into okay. a type of protein consistently based on the letter sequence that it's reading gotcha. on the RNA. Does that... Makes sense. I, I may be yeah, it does, it does. That. I think I, I, I personally, I'm not this is, how, this is my summation. Answer. No, this is my summation. Um, the genetic code, when I, when I think of the genetic code, I think of the letters A, T, G, and C. That is, those are a code. Those are secondary symbols representing a primary symbol. No when problem. When do they those stop code. being a code? When you talk about information. When you're just talking about the information that's flowing from one point to another point, that's not a code. That's information in the system. That's not transportable. You can't take that information and convert it to binary. Codes have to be transportable. You have to be able to convert it from one form to another. You can't do that in this particular case. So I can convert I the ATs to symbols. So because can't put it into a symbols. computer and a computer can make a protein? Just because there's no, no, only no. one how, thing that can decipher I have the code and, that turn, DNA, and turn it into a protein. How do you convert? If I say DNA is in this code in DNA, how do I convert that into Braille? Right. 
the only thing that's the Braille's going to show is something that represents A, T, G, and C, correct? Because right. it's not linguistic information. Braille is, is linguistic communication information. And that's so why we're back to codes can only be linguistic by your definition. Right. And by the way, um, so, I'm not arguing that DNA is a cipher or the, uh, I'm not arguing that this all is as a cipher. I'm arguing that it could be a cipher, maybe a code in Lucy's definition, but it's pseudo code, pseudo cipher. It's not really one or the other in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. My, I'm arguing my, that the genetic my, code. Okay. okay go ahead. The, I'm arguing that the, the, the genetic code, that is a code. The, the genetic code, go that ahead. codon chart, the set of rules that govern the way that the genome communicates with the ribosome, that code is a code in exactly the same way that binary code is a code. Binary it is a code, code according to the rules, according to the definition by Claude Shannon. Okay. All right. Okay. Now it's up to people to go, go look at the, go look into this and decide for themselves. <laughs> if, uh, yeah. if I think you, any, I, so, I think you're close there, Shannon. I, I have to agree with Shannon. I, I like the way she gave her final thing on that. I'm not, I think you I think you got it pretty much. So I don't. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess. <laughs> sure. All right. I, I I'm um, still not clear on when it stops being a code or if it is, but I appreciate both well, of it, you. Have it depends dialogue. on what you mean by stop. What do you mean by stop? Because there's well, he said that he agrees that the letters he, he he agrees that the letters on the RNA sequence are a code, right? The letters are a code. What do you mean by letters? You, you, you find letters. You or you in this case, the you RNA, because obviously yeah, you, you yes. don't have T in RNA. Yeah, that's a code. So the letter sequence yeah. on the RNA as it goes through the ribosome that is a code. So the letters themselves no, are a code. No, Once it nothing hits, going through the ribosome. No, is a code. they're not. No, nothing, no, 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 no. The letters going... on the RNA, the letters on the RNA are a code, are they not? Well, hang on. One sec, one sec. There's no, actually no letters on the RNA. They're chemicals. They're nuclear. Yeah, types, I right? understand. The only thing that, 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 that the letter G is that, written on a but, goddamn RNA. Oh, I, 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 that is such a, <laughs> that's, that's why the language is so loose. That is why we have these issues because language is so poor for these types of things. Guanine <laughs> is on RNA, right? Am I wrong about uh, that? Yeah. The, the, yes, the chemicals yeah. on there. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stick. We'll stick with that guanine, right? Okay, so that's one of the chemicals that's on RNA, right? Yeah, so that's one of the nuclear bases. You agree yeah. that that is a portion of a code, at least? No, is it not? It's it's not okay. No. Well, then the what symbols, did you earlier? The, the, the symbols. symbols the, okay. If you look at a, symbol A T G okay. and C, those yeah, yeah. symbols. That's the code. The symbology. So those symbols oh, are us. Transmitting, I no, I get what you, I get what you're saying now. So those symbols are us as humans giving a, list, a letter representation. I said, well, yeah, let me finish my sentence so that I can actually agree with yes. you, Steve, for the love of Jesus. So that letter is us as humans giving that chemical a symbol so that we can transmit the information that that represents to ourselves. So the chemical itself is not a code, but when we translate it into those letters, it becomes a code because that's a that's something that we use to understand how that works. It's just a translation. Yeah, okay. Right. I, 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 so I, I understand that. what's happened is a code for water, right? That's a symbol. No, no. Okay. So, so what's happened here? Here's where you're confused. If you pull up my slide again, if we can actually look at the genetic code, um, you could actually draw this by instead of drawing um, C U U, you could actually draw those three nucleotides instead, and then instead of doing the amino acid. L-E-U, you could actually draw that amino acid. So if we were to replace these with actual drawings of those things instead of the letters, would that, would that, what would that do for you? Well, well you mean, you'd actually draw out the, the molecule. The amino, acid, the, 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 the amino acids have the same basic structure, right? It has a COOH and the NH2, and then it has your R group, right? Your residue, right? So they're all, 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 car, all amino acids are the same thing except the residue changes, correct? On the same basic structure, right? Your, no, your, amino acids have a different carboxyl, different amino acids uh, have different uh, side chains. The side chain, which is your argument, uh, is your residue, right? Yeah. That so, but the the yeah, other structure, yeah. the the NH two and the COOH on the amino acids are exactly the same. All amino acids are identical except for that side chain, right? And that's what changes. Okay, that's, that's one of the reasons why yeah. proteins fold the way they do. You're not answering my question. Just listen to my question here. If I were to draw this exact same chart, but instead of using letters, I used actual drawings of each molecule. 
what would that do for you? Would that make this no longer a code? code? Yeah, that's just. So you're saying that this picture. You're saying that this is a code. You're saying that this is a code because there's letters on it. But if I swap I those mean, letters out, I, with drawings of molecules, would it no longer be a code? Yeah, because it can. A code. A code has to have conveyance of, of a meaning, right? And and like a word. Yeah. Like a, again, my example with the car and nuclear weapon. Car conveys a meaning to nuclear weapon. Just a symbol. That's more of a cipher than anything. A ci you're dealing with. Uh, you're you're okay. taking one thing and you're converting it into a different symb symbol. That's a ciphering. That's how do I you look speak, at it. Do you speak more than one language? Yeah, language is not a code. But I know, I speak a little speak Spanish. more than one language? Okay. Uh, really. I'm, <laughs> so you seem really hung up on what a symbol can be. A symbol doesn't have to be a letter. A symbol can be anything. I understand that. Um, an apple, yeah, I, 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 an I, I, apple I, I, can be a symbol. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, in a code... All right, listen. Steve, let him, get, Steve, let him on, finish. Yes. You, you have to let John Holy finish fuck. his thought. He is very patient and lets you finish your thoughts. Just let him finish his thought. And stop interrupting him, please. Yes. John, go ahead. In the genetic code, molecules are used as symbols. Mm -hmm. the, the codon, the three molecules, do not actually represent serine, the amino acid. They are, they are not actually serine, the amino, the amino acid. They are a symbol for serine that the ribosome understands. The ribosome receives that, and, and I'm going to anthropomorphize a, here, a bit here. It says, oh, I need to grab a serine. And so it grabs a serine, and it adds it to the, the protein chain. Now, of course, you and I know mechanically how that all works. But... The codon, the three nucleotides, act as a symbol in this communication system. And this chart shows us the rules that it shows us what all those symbols mean. But they are yeah, I think, symbols. I think, you're just wrong. I think you're just wrong on that. You're just, uh, I think all you're doing is you're saying these are my instruction sets and I'm calling that a code. And that's not what a code is. Um, instruction set is not a code unless you're looking at the actual, in, like an assembly, like like CMP or a, uh, you know JNZ. These those are a code because that's the symbology that represents something else, right? And you're, you're the, the 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 fact that there are rules. That's not the code. The rules are not the code. I, I mean, maybe in a legal sense, but this is not even a legal sense. And, so I think and a Shannon sense, rules with he code. literally describes it that way, <laughs> like. In a Claude, by Claude well, Shannon's definition, a code is the set of rules governing a communication system. Yeah, I think he's using it a little bit different way than you think. But anyways, that's my presentation. And we'll let kind of people go from there. I, I, th I think that oh, you guys aren't going to agree. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, I, mean I, I don't know how many times I could tell, tell him that I think he's equivocating. It's I think becoming he's circular. It's, it's becoming really, to, really, 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 really. Yeah, we need to get uh, ahead, team, uh, hashtag Team Cypher and hashtag Team Code t-shirts made up. <laughs> well, well, no, because uh, I'm not claiming no, because I'm not arguing with the cipher either. I think it's I think it's kind of neither in the big picture. I think they're pseudo cipher or pseudo code. Um, oh, I don't think, I think that we ever. have a little. I think that we have. I said this earlier. I think we have limitations in the English file language. Less than two years yeah. when kids. I think we have limitations <laughs> in the English language that prevent us from adequately describing certain things. And this is one of those cases where I think that there's limitations because there's so many different ways to describe something linguistically and from different fields that these words mean different things. Okay. Let, let me just end by saying um, why I think this matters because I think that's something that I haven't really said yet today. The genetic code, like all codes, is arbitrary. You, you could invent a cell that uses a completely different set of rules. This chart that we're looking at here would be completely different. You could create a cell that, that uses a completely different set. We've actually learned already that some organisms use a different set. So they already exist, even in nature. The genetic code is a set of symbols that, that the genome uses to communicate with the ribosome. What does it communicate about? It communicates about the structure of a protein. It communicates that across it transmits that from the genome to the ribosome. The reason this is so important is that this communication system is complicated. Not only that, it's optimized. We didn't talk, I didn't talk about the optimization of coding systems, but you, know, you can make any symbol mean anything if you are inventing a coding system. But some symbols, if you use them a lot, you, you want them to be easier to use. So in Morris code, for example, E, which is the most common letter ever sent in Morse code, in English at least, is represented by one dot. 
and they optimized it that like that on purpose for ease of use. And the genome, the genetic code that we're looking at right here, this this chart here, these are actually optimized as well. And they are optimized for so that the ribosome doesn't misread things. The ribosome is not a perfect machine. It misreads things sometimes. And this is optimized in a way that it doesn't screw up when it's misreading. This is a complicated communication system and we need an explanation as to how it arose. And people who are studying the origin of life are doing that and they're spending a lot of time and a lot of money doing that. And that's why I think it's important to, to just disregard it and say, oh, it's not a code because some creationist made an argument that I don't know how, how to, how to re rebuke. To, that's, that's really silly. Like this is a real code and we want to understand where it came from. We want to understand how it evolved. And people studying the origin of life are, do, are trying to do that right now. There's researchers working on that. So right. well, I think let me it's reiterate, important. Okay. Let me reiterate here that this has nothing to do with intelligent design. Um, I'm not an intelligent design advocate. I don't give a crap what their arguments are. I will go after people for bad arguments, whether they're intelligent designer, atheist, theist, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I don't think this has anything to do with intelligent design. So if they are using this for their bad arguments or whatever, that's irrelevant to what I think, right? And so I don't know why that straw man keeps getting brought up. Um, if, if intelligent I'm design- I'm bringing that up because people keep it, standing in a line. Every, every time I hear the argument that code's not a code, yeah, I, but but it's not a like code because it's not a code. It has nothing to do with the idea. Ninety percent of your listeners are are it's because of that argument. Um, and, 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 a and, genetic and, code and, is a real I, code. One sec. I think atheists okay, let's see you know, as well as I, I think they make a lot of bad arguments, right? And I call them out on it all the time. So it's not like I'm afraid to call the atheists out for bad arguments. This is not a bad argument by them. It's not a code. I disagree with you on that. Can I, I ask one question? Do I don't think it's atheist. I think it's biologist. We'll call it not a you code. You disagree? In the true sense. What? <laughs> Steve, crazy, what I is know. it then? If it's, if it's not a code, concisely, what is it? It has elements of both, depending on what definitions you use from what field. Oh, dear Lord Jesus. Both, what is it? Oh, that, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's sorry. DNA. I'm sorry. It's a chemical. I'm sorry. It's a that macromolecule. You can't say it, it, it to be comprised Does of every, different elements from from other places, and you and you say that he's wrong for using it from another place. That doesn't make sense. Does Does everybody here know what plain text is? Sense. Does everyone here know what plain text is? I have no idea. No. I don't know. Because I got I, don't know I got some anymore. I got some plain text for Steve and John. There's two minutes yeah. left before ten o'clock Eastern time. That's how much time you have left on my machine. That's plain text. <laughs> Yeah, well, Dave. Yeah, Dave yeah, is I'm putting us on timeout. <laughs> well, no, let me just gonna, use no, that. We're not going to. We're not going to cut it off at ten. Hold on. Let me. Let me interrupt. We're not going to cut it off at ten. We're going to go until we get. A, a, um, we get our thoughts. I'm, out. We're not, oh, I'm, I'm just I, playing. I, I'm just playing. I'm just. I'm just making I, a joke. I, like I said, I. I think it's just. Uh, Physiochemical reactions. I think that DNA is just a macromolecule that has the ability to, to produce proteins, and that's all through conformational changes. Um, and that's what the information is that that I think Shannon even refers to is is that there has to be some kind of intentionality there. Shannon, if I remember correctly, doesn't mention he either says intent or intentionality. That's a critical thing because there is no intent, there is no agency, there is no intentionality in things like ribosomes, even even in a teleological, excuse me, a teleonomic type. Thing. There's no agency there, and yes, agency requires some kind of consciousness. That's literally what the word means to be able to but change there is your brain state. Though. To decide, there is definitely information. Yeah, absolutely. There's information that's, that's being translated into proteins consistently. Yeah, like, the so information that the, the same sequence will be translated, for lack of a better term, into the same proteins consistently. But that's yeah. The way, you can understand how it's complex for me to not understand how that's yeah, not a code when it's consistently right. translated into the same thing. Information arbitrator that translates that information output consistently the same. Right? Information yeah. something that translates that information output consistently the same, but not the same as the information. But the, informa the, the information is not the code. But, it's, but you don't the information know what is not a code. They... Okay. No, I do know what it, I mean. I do know what okay. information is. Information is what's required to describe the state of a system. I'm and that's not why suggesting Shannon gets that you me. don't. I'm just like, well, hang on. I what, don't understand what, what? why it's not, though. Like, can you could, for some, because for I'm a layperson like me, this seems like semantics. 
It's not. But, but you can't tell me what it is. It's not a code. It's definitely not a code. What is it? I don't not know. A bunch of different not shit. The tree, not in the true definition. Yeah, not, <laughs> not in, the, in the strictest sense. It's not a code. Now, information, again, when Shannon's talking about this, Shannon, uh, Shannon's talking about Shannon. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're talking about entropic okay. states. We're talking about the entropy I'm so of the lost. system, right? And the entropy, the entropy is the unusable energy in a system. In this case, how much is wasted? How much is lost by sending information through a noisy channel, right? When a noisy channel is you have the, you have, um, you need more bits of information than you normally would use in a clean channel, right? Because of what's called entropy. And what I described in my presentation that in for a four, four nucleotides, you need two bits of information, right? That's the minimal amount to convey information, but the code is the C, T, G, and A. The zero, zero, the zero, one, that's not the code, right? The code is what I'm coding for is for the nucleotides. The information is just what it is to get to zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one. That information, that signal, and if you ever look at discrete signal processing between like um, a quad operational amplifier or, or any kind of electronics, you have a lot of signal processing, right? That well, signal processing, that okay. information that's in those that in those discrete systems is not ever called code. I've, I've never seen code used right. in electronics that way. So if you're looking at the Turing question. model, right? The, oh, the, 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 the computer, the Turing model. If you look at the Turing model, the computer is a ribosome to me. Like his computer is a ribosome. Nazi information, Turing's computer, output protein. And the, and the difference is that we, we designed a computer. We, have the, we are the agent. So we, it's we all are, comes we, down to that. This is why John brought that up because it all comes down to, well, then that means there's a designer. Why does there have no, to not be? Necessarily, no, that, it, it doesn't have to be. Well, Again, then why can't it, it be a code? I'm so confused. Code. Right? I mean, even if that's the case, even if that's even okay. if you take the syllogism as is, right, it's not a very convincing syllogism because you're just doing it based upon descriptive definitions. Right? It's not, not a convincing syllogism, syllogism at all. Why, even like, if why the is case, that analogy? Is that I, not analogous, though? Is, no. Is that not if analogous? I say, I'm defining a word to mean this in my premise. I'm defining it this way, and then for and so the, the conclusion system. is based upon that, 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 that definition. Okay, great, but I can define it some other way, and it no longer works, right? It, these are all you understand how why I can master systems. Okay, go ahead. Let me ask this just, question from from the live chat real quick, um, just because I think it uh, it is, is prevalent. Um, they asked, do you, would it be uh, Steve? Would you consider it fair to say that we have um, codified? Our understanding of DNA by creating a model that uh, a model that is represented in code. I think it's fair to say it's codified. As an analogy, codify just means to have a specific rule set of rules, right? That's what codification means, right? If I codify something, I am writing it down and saying you have to to obey these rules. That's what code is in that regard. So we have done that, okay. in that. and again, John, John codification because it's not what you mean by it? DNA's code. DNA is not a legal no, code. Dude. It's not a codified system like that. Okay. There is a one. very specific set of rules that the ribosome uses with the chain of RNA. So the chain of RNA, the messenger is RNA, the that is the message. See, and the ribosome is using a very specific set of rules to read that message and output a protein. Uh, so and okay, the code is written. Like, Dave, those rules are since, since code 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 transportability, on chart. Dave, Dave, hit the, the, rules, the, rules, the rules exist in the structure of tRNA. I mean, that's where they actually exist in the cell. But in a textbook, they're going to exist in the code on chart. The code on chart is what we use to show each other the code that governs the, uh, the genetic system. And, and here's the can I respond? Sure. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the difference is, is you're looking at a descriptive system. We're looking at something and going, we're describing what we're seeing. We're making the code on chart. Nothing about that's prescriptive, right? The, the, the rules of how things work do not have to obey that code on chart. It's that we look at that code on chart and we, well, we came up with the code on chart because we observed something. You're confusing descriptive with prescriptive. And for a set of rules in a codification, that's... You are wrong. Hang on. I'm not wrong. That's prescriptive, meaning that we're, <laughs> I'm not wrong on this. Prescriptive means this is how it has to be. We're defining something to be the case that you have to obey a set of rules. That's prescriptive. Code on chart is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. 
It doesn't change the reality. If I change that code on chart, if I make something else, something else, reality is not going to change. It is not prescriptive. That's the biggest difference I think you're missing. The tRNA, the three nucleotides in a tRNA, and the tRNA that attaches to serine determine which three nucleotides in the messenger RNA can code for serine. They are, they are determining that. They are prescribing that. It is the you're structure of the tRNA that's prescribing that. Yeah, you're not understanding what I'm we saying. Can, we are then, we are then describing it. No, no, I understand. We then described it by in figuring out what the tRNA is, is prescribing. And we and we write that down as a chart, okay? And our our chart is a description of the actual rules that are governing the transcription system, or the translation system. That's not for so. So you're right. You're right. We've got a we've got a uh, a chart that is describing a real thing that actually exists in your cells, a real set of rules that actually exist in your cells that are governing the communication system. Like who yeah. are the rulers of that communication system? That would be the tRNA. They are dictating what that actual system is. They're the kings of it, if you want to say. Rules that that reality has to follow. We don't write the rules. No, nothing's writing the rules. They're, they're from an evolutionary. They're from an evolutionary project of a process that's coming out by emergent things. There's no directionality there. There's no direct communication in that system. It's all because of an emergent thing. There's nothing saying this has to be this way. As you even said, it's arbitrary. Prescriptive means that it is this way. We are saying it must be this way because we've decreed it to be this way. There's nothing decreeing it to be that way. It is that way because it's an emergent thing from evolution. If you mutate a tRNA and change the genetic code by mutating it, the organism will die immediately. Well as soon as the that, proteins that it produces fail. I'm not saying that's relative to what I just said. Because this, this, this coding system is, is governing how our, how our cells work. So I was saying if it works consistently and accurately, like it, it, it consistently, the rule, if the rules, as we understand them, continue to be adhered to, then it produces accurate genetic information that we're able to use to continue to survive. So is it it seems that it seems that this argument, if I if I'm not mistaken, seems to be hinging on whether or not it was created by somebody. And that's the only way something oh. can be a code. Is if so a code can be not created by can you, Steve, can you give me an example of a code that wasn't <laughs> created by a mind? If you remember that you rewind the tape and you remember going in, I wasn't going to argue whether uh, whether it required a mind or not. I actually said that at the very beginning for this very reason, right? I'm not going to argue whether it requires a code or not. I can argue if it does require a code, then it's this. If it doesn't, or it's maybe, if it does require an intelligence, this. If it doesn't, then this. But I don't have a stand on it either way. If you want to use code as if it requires an intelligence or not, it again it depends on what um, area that you're coming from. As simple as that. But you'll excuse me if it seems like a lot of your arguments seem to kind of hinge on a, an intelligent sender and an intelligent receiver and an intelligent Most person. Most of it does for, when it comes to things like a code. Yeah. Yeah. Most okay. of it does. But, I mean, you, yeah. so, but you won't give a definition of a code that doesn't require an intelligent mind. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know any off the top of my head. Um, if there are some, I'm willing to okay. accept that. And it doesn't change my argument so, in, in any way. Okay. I'm so not arguing there are natural, natural codes. I'm not arguing that. There might be. <laughs> John I don't know of any, and I'm not <laughs> concerned about that because it doesn't change my argument if there is. Okay. No, the genetic code is sure one of many codes that that was not designed. Yeah, it's one of many codes that was not designed. Again, communication systems and the rules that govern them throughout biology. So, John, for you, a code is. Because there, there was lots of people in the chat, and I feel like I've been picking on Steve. This because this because I like picking on Steve. Um, I for like. you, uh, people have been <laughs> arguing. People in the chat have been saying that essentially like your. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, because I understand better. Uh, that your definition is over overly ambiguous, and it allows it that to to be 
translated to any time information is transmitted and received, then that can be defined as a code. And then that it becomes too easily overextended in those circumstances. Because yeah. what are all chemical reactions a code? No, a chemical reaction is not a code. Uh, okay. Again, again. Why? So if you look at the codon chart, there are symbols. So the three nucleotides in the genetic code are symbols that represent an amino acid. They are symbols. In a chemical reaction, you don't have, you don't have symbols. Uh, okay. In in the genetic code, you have real symbols. And again, it is is there a communication system? The the definition of a code is a set of rules that govern a communication system. For a communication system, you need a sender, a receiver, you need to transmit that information across a channel. Like that was already described. The definition that I'm using is the definition that. Claude Shannon uses, and it's the definition that gave rise to the digital revolution. This this allowed people to realize that look, we don't have to just we can invent codes out of pretty much anything. We can we can have two machines talk to each other. We don't need an intelligent person to intervene. We can have machines talk to other machines if we have a code, a set of rules that governs that communication. They can talk to each other. This was a huge deal, uh, and that's why. Claude Shannon is so, uh, you know, famous among people in that study computer science. Well, if, if, I, if, I could, awesome. if I could say something real quick, I think you just kind of shot yourself in the foot by your, what you just said, because you just said chemical reactions are a code, but the process of the central dogma biology from, from DNA to mRNA to, to protein, that whole transcription to translation is one big chemical reaction. It's one big exchanging of information of how to do conformational changes. It's physiochemical. Yes. That's why Absolutely. it's not a, it, it, that's, again, chemical reactions are not a code. There's no code in that system. The code is what we interpret okay. and we give it meaning. No, 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 you're wrong. So a chemical reaction wrong, is guess. not necessarily a code. <laughs> there, are chemical, there are chemical reactions that go, everything, there are chemical reactions in the genetic code, but a, a chemical reaction is not a code. A code, again, let me just say this super slow, is a set of rules governing a communication system. So if chemical reactions are involved in that, that's fine. So, so, so reaction so, in and so, of itself is not a code. To form water, those are obey chemical rules. You have to, that's you have to repeat that. You have to repeat that. He had you muted. You have to repeat that. Yeah. Nobody just oh. called the tail into that. So the rules for like hydrogen, two hydrogen and, and oxygen coming together to form water, there's rules involved in that because it's a chemical process that must follow a certain thing. I mean, you, you, you put hydrogen and oxygen together in the right conditions and they form a, a water molecule. There's rules of chemistry that dictate that. That's a code? No, because it's not a communication system. It's communicating how to again? make the molecule. No. What's the difference? It's not a communication system. There's not two entities that are communicating to each other. In the genome, there hydrogen are two entities oxygen. communicating to each other. No, Come no, no. it is not a communication Come system. I showed you a chart of a communication system in Claude Shannon's paper. I defined it very specifically. Why do you not understand this? You even watched I, me take my test yesterday. I, do, actually. I, I, I asked him again, that question like five times a day. Asking the same I, question. I, 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 I've, I've, I've read his stuff and I've actually had discussions with people who are PhDs on this that are disagreeing with you. So if I don't understand and they don't understand, I'm cool with that. Um, but no, I've had, you don't, like, again, you not talk to some of the PhD communications. Don't paper the way you do. You talk and, to, and two a, of them are you talk to, a to a biologist. You, you talk to two biologists that don't understand about communication DNA, yes. systems. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If I'm one of the two asked about John. DNA. What's, what's Shannon? Yeah. What are, what are the two entities? John, what are the two entities that are communicating the with genome, one another in order for that chemical reaction to not fit the qualifications of any other chemical reaction? The genome is communicating by sending a message, by transcribing a message into RNA, mm -hmm. sending that message, transmitting it through the cell to the ribosome. So you have the genome and you have the ribosome. These are the two entities that are communicating to each other. What are they communicating about? They're communi com communicating about the structure of a protein. That's what they're talking about. So there's a purpose in the transmission. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you're using teleological language, which uh, a lot of people don't like talk using in biology. But yes, the the there is the point is to communicate the structure of a protein. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, we're gonna uh, go ahead, Shane. No, I, I, I'm almost, I, I don't even know anymore. I don't even know how to define the word code anymore, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need to drink uh, uh, Moose cars and driveways and mountains you. and mailbox. As long as words don't mean anything, I'm just going to spout them out. You know, because definition <laughs> doesn't mean definition. And, um, no, words don't mean words. Uh, uh, so uh, right. if you thought that uh, we couldn't, uh, that we were, winding down you're wrong because the people in the live chat want a after show so we will be having an after show on this channel to uh bring in uh, people from the live chat that want to hash it out further of course oh. everybody in the will be sweet Jesus. invited um <laughs> and we'll see how that uh how that goes um oh, i promised i wouldn't drink today guys... <laughs> <laughs> it's a holiday <laughs> I'm going to let these guys um, wrap up their uh, points, and um, I'm going to ask that they be allowed to make their entire argument, or not argument, but their entire closing statement without interruption. Please, Steve. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I'll just say um, uh, I think I've explained it uh, too many times in the same way. So there's no point in, in doing it again, but there, one thing that might help for people, something that I didn't get to is how it is that uh, DNA codes for protein very specifically. And I, I didn't bother doing that today because Steve had gone over it, but uh, I did a video yesterday showing uh, exactly what all the molecules look like, showing how the entire thing happens start to finish that people can go ahead and watch on the stated casually channel. Uh, that's called what is the genetic code. And so if you want to understand more the physical, how the physical processes work, all communication systems work through physical processes. Uh, I'm talking right now. It's a physical process. Um, I'm using sound waves as symbols in this communication system. DNA uses codons as symbols. So it uses molecules as symbols. Air the entire process of communicating is, it's always a physical process. Uh, the same is true in the genetic code. And you can learn about that process on that video, so. Okay, see? Um, I think the real question here though is, um, do colors exist? Um, I think that's really what I it see. boils down to. I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, all I, gotta, all I gotta say on this is look at, um, you know, any okay. minor issue or mistake that I may have had as a lay person, I'm cool with that. I'm open to correction if people want to like say, well, you know what, you're 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 right on that, a little bit wrong on that. I'm totally cool with that. Um, but when people go vote on this, all I ask is who do you think had a better presentation and what makes more sense to you? Um, I think that I clearly pointed out that DNA is not a code. I think that um, fortunately, John has a lot of misconceptions when it comes just to um, the relating information to code and signaling and, and all this. And he's looking at it from a very myopic point of view of just Claude Shannon, rather than the bigger picture of, of DNA itself and what a code is and is and isn't in, in semiotics and what it is in, crypt, in cryptography, because this is what it mainly, coding has to do with cryptography more than anything else, right? You're, you're taking something and you're converting it to something else for whatever person, for, for purpose. But you had asked earlier, Shannon, I'm gonna leave you with this as, as a, for a definition of something. And I thought this was interesting. Um, one of the definitions uh, that's out there uh, for encode is um, to convert a message into a code or to another language or to an, okay. And I think that's the problem here. He's thinking this because of the conversion. He, there's something being converted from one thing to another that has to be a code and it's not, it's an or. And so just because you're, you're changing something from one form to another and you're changing it um, across a system from, from two things, a sender and receiver, inherently doesn't make it a code. It just makes it information transfer. So I leave it at that. Okay, uh, now, uh, John, uh, I fucked it up the first time. What, um, what is the appropriate word, the poll that I'll put up in, in Twitter based on uh, the conversation? Is the, the genetic code a code? Would that be? 
Yeah, yeah, that, that would work. Okay. All right. All right, so guys, um, I'll put that up here. Uh, here well, now. hang on. Um, I disagree. I don't like that title because oh the genetic God, code no. is a code. If you're I, no, because no. this is critical. If you change that, if you change it no. to that, I agree because the genetic code is A T G and C is a code. So I again, <laughs> what do you mean by genetic code? I'm gonna pull my fucking hair out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can't just change the, you can't change it to something no, completely sure different that, that that makes it a different question. As and I agree with the genetic code. If A T G and C is a code, that's his. Steve, problems. how would you word the question then? Steve, how would you word the question? Do you not watch the same debate you know that what? I just did? I, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm so convinced that, I'm, that I've put forth a better argument and that more people will be convinced that it's not a code. Word it the way you wish. I'll let the people decide. Oh, my God. You, you could just ask it, Team Steve, Team John, right? I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's better. Because if you ask the question, is genetic code a code? Again, you you imagine yeah, the difference what you mean by code. If they think ATG and Z, uh, ATG and C, then yes, it's a code. That's it. I'm going to start yes, drinking. I'm going to start that drinking. That's the, it. The, the, the question there. <laughs> I don't even care what time of day it is. I don't care okay, well, guys, um, just... guys uh, you can, you can um, find that on Twitter here in the next um, five minutes. I, um, yeah, I'm so, con I'm so, I'm so confused, Steve, right now. I'm, I'm so, <laughs> I'm so lost. We'll let the experts come in and but sort it all out. How about that? Yeah. Sound good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Herman's dying in the chat. Herman is dying. Ar ar argument. Team Steve, so. so we will be having a, 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 an after show here in about 30 minutes. We will start it um, up. I will, for the guys on the call, I'll put the um, the link to it in uh, in Twitter, in the DMs that uh, are our group chat. And then um, if you are wanting to actually be in the call, if you're a Patreon, you get um, – Choice come in, um, and then I know uh, Dr. Mays, um, CRISPR. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if Dr. Mays. I don't. I don't. I didn't see where there, where he answered if he wanted to come in or not. But if you do, Dr. Mays, send me a message on um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, TDM, Twitter. And Twitter. I mean Facebook, which really means Twitter. So, so we're we're keeping with the code of. Either. Um, I swear. Yeah, uh, I want to say thank you, thank you, both, uh, Shannon and uh, John and Steve for. Uh, put together those presentations. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to like. I, I love passionate debates, and um, especially, I think with, with two people that are able to make it about the the you know the science and not personal. You know what I mean? Like these two will, you know, it doesn't carry over, and that's the, the important thing. I think that, that shows me true. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, this is. A, I, I I think the world. Of, I love his videos. I, I'm telling you, if you guys want to learn biology. Go watch his stuff. He's he actually is one of the reasons I got started reading about biology again. Honestly, yeah. So that makes a difference, you know. Yeah. Those are the best kind of debate. So this was good, um, and I think that uh, it was fruitful. And we thank you guys for watching. As always, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, if you are familiar with poisoning the well, uh, Sophane from poisoning the well will be on tomorrow with Casey and I, and um, on ideology. So that's going to be. A lot of fun. He is hilarious. If you haven't seen his work, go check it out. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, um, Dave, roll that beautiful bean footage. Oh. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> roll what? Excuse me? Yeah, I don't know what anything means anymore. It's a, it's, have you ever seen Bush's fake bean? Come on, guys. The, the fake bean commercial? Dog says it. <laughs> Yeah. I don't yeah, know what you're probably. talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Big bean fish. Dave, I just mean take us, take us off the air. Oh, I can do that. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated.